what what I don't know and what we haven't talked about is what um, when you started to think you were going to have a career in the army, or when you started thinking about the armed services. I assume it was high school, and I assume it was, it was probably ROTC. It was no, it wasn't ROTC. Did you actually, do ROTC? Actually, no, we didn't have it. Oh. Uh, but we, but I did join the National Guard. Right. Uh, somewhat illegally. Yeah. When I turned 15. I got my dad, bless his heart, to sign a piece of paper that said I was 17. So I got to join when I, the week I turned 15, yeah. and I had those extra years of service. You know, I, by a fluke of regulations, those extra two years even counted in re, in calculating my retirement. Uh, there was yeah. a so you had, you had 20 years of the army and two years in. The Guard? National Guard, yeah. I had 20, 20 years of active duty in the regular Army. I had uh, two and a half years, or two and three quarters years in the, the National Guard. But by a fluke, the, the law coming up to 1958 was that, uh, or 19, uh, yeah. 58 when you graduated, right? 58 was the cutoff year for National Guard service to count towards regular army and I so I had accidentally two years of service that counted in just like I was in the regular army oh, wow. for calculating my and pay. And you could you could keep your commission and go from the guard to to army navy air force marines at that time right? Um, yeah you could apply to, to transfer your commission to any other. I what I did um, didn't get commissioned in the National Guard I joined the National Guard uh, because I had a friend who was an orphan who uh, actually uh, was in the guard, he was two years older than me, and he also got a job as the keeper of the National Guard Armory in West Palm Beach. So he had a little room in there, slept there, and he was, he was a gung-ho soldier. And he got me kind of hooked on, on memorizing the, the training manuals and becoming a, becoming a, a well-informed National Guardsman. Which is how I also got promoted to sergeant within two years in the National Guard. I was I was uh, gung ho uh, at that point, and and remained that way when I went in the regular army. Is that anyone I've ever heard of? Is that Riggs or no? Um, Don Cahill. I don't think you knew Don, but I've heard the name though. Yeah, yeah. We used to we did a lot of things together. We we took off to a uh, a, a boy. Boy Scout Order of the Arrow Convention in Indiana <laughs> in my car, Don Cahill and I, we were all underage and we took a about a five-foot alligator with us, which was uh, <laughs> our mascot. <laughs> we had fun entering little restaurants up in, up, up in Kentucky and <laughs> Indiana with our, our gator. We cleared a few. <laughs> Okay, so I just brought up another question for you. You were an Eagle Scout. What age were you an Eagle Scout? Uh, about the same time. I, I finished my Eagle Scout about the time I joined the National Guard. Okay, so around so 15. I was I was, I was uh, 15 ish. Yeah. 15 looked 28. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was big for my age and looked over. I was always, from the time I was, uh, you know, 13 or 14, I was the guy who had to buy the beer because I looked the yeah. oldest. Even though I was the youngest. <laughs> so that picture of you in uniform in the 55 Bel Air, I think, or 50, uh, it's a Chevy. I yeah. No, I, I was guard, in, right? I was in the active army at that time. Oh, you were? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that's after 50. I can tell from that, the patch I'm wearing is the 2nd Infantry Division at, at Fort Benning. That was my first assignment. I trained troops in the 2nd Infantry Division. First in the engineer battalion, and then I uh, got transferred to uh, an infantry battalion. And is, I, I was a awesome? platoon, platoon sergeant for basic trainees for about uh, a little over a year. Is that also the picture of you behind a, a machine gun in a in a training scenario? Um, Do you know what one I'm talking I, about? I don't. I can't pick out one picture. I wish I would have had my phone. Yeah, yeah. Sure. But yeah, I'm sure it was. If, if I'm behind a machine gun, it was during that period. You know. Or, or it might have been taken during OCS training or... Nothing on the uniform looked familiar to me, that's why I asked. Uh, it looked like uh, it might have been something I didn't recognize. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, I, my first uh, year in the Army, 
58, about a year exactly, was I was already a staff sergeant, and I, I uh, was training troops as a platoon sergeant. I had a platoon of, of trainees and uh, had a great company commander, a great first sergeant. I mean, these people were the, some of the best I ever met in my, in my career. Is this at uh, Benning? That's at Fort Benning, yeah. Uh, Captain Reed Jensen, my company commander, later died in, in Vietnam uh, as a major, but he was a West Pointer and was just an incredible officer. He's the guy who told me I was wasting my time, I should get on over to OCS, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and did submit my application, and, and I went because of him. I had been trying up until that point uh, to get into West Point. I, when I was in high school, I competed, I got the third alternate, and I fully qualified for the entrance. They test you for the entrance exam, both mentally and physically. Where did you go for the entrance exam, or did they we, do that? We right? went. I uh, went to Fort Benning, Georgia. Okay. They took us all the way up to Fort Benning, Georgia, put us through a full day of physical, a full day of of um, physical fitness training to see what we could do, and um, and uh, a written test, which was basically IQ, you know. The Army's version of IQ, right. um, and I, as I say, I came out fully qualified, and I got two more appointments after that. Each year, um, I got the second alternate, and I got the first alternate. And the last year, I could have, I could have perhaps gotten the principal, but I, uh, I, my company commander said, "Why don't I get you into this class that that starts?" Uh, I guess it was. July, I think it was July of 1959, and they said, you'll be a second lieutenant by Christmas time. <laughs> was that just the uh, the uncertainty of whether you would get into West Point as a first alternate? Was right. Was the motivating factor there? Right, yeah, because I had already had three years where I fully qualified. I mean, I was, right. I was they were ready to take me, but I just didn't have the slot. Uh, I got one year, I was... Senator Smathers, a uh, good historic name in Florida, uh, first alternate. And Smathers, it was Florida at large, so it was a competitive exam, a lot of things involved. But I, but the guy ahead of me got accepted. I met that guy. Uh, it's kind of an interesting story. That's just when we were uh, firing Army missiles to get the U.S. back in the space program. And, uh, and this kid, uh, Nice kid from uh, Cocoa Beach. Oh, he's from NASA. Open yeah, he he uh, was very anxious to get into the Army rocketry space program, and uh, they were anxious to have him. He was he was a mathematician, so he was the he was the choice, and I was the alternate. If he couldn't have gone, I would have gone. But uh, anyhow, I moved on. I, uh, at the grand old age of nineteen. I got into OCS. Wow. So um, that, that. So when you say you're the you were the youngest company commander in the modern militia, you were, and it's it's because of the age requirement. Oh that yeah, yeah. No, no one else gets commissioned before they're 21. You know. Yeah. And I was commissioned two years earlier at 19. In fact, when I when I graduated from OCS, I was um, an honor graduate of OCS. Uh, in the top five percent, and the top five percent uh, got to pick their branch and pick their first assignment. And it was a big reward system for being at the top of your class. So I, I picked uh, the 82nd Airborne Division, which meant that I had to go to jump school, and, and, uh, and I talked them into sending me to Ranger School too. And uh, I had a couple of setbacks. One of them, when I started um, jump school initially, uh, right after OCS, uh, I broke my leg on uh, the jump towers through week three. So um, I had to recycle that. And then I also had ranger school scheduled. And they, my career planner, the people in charge for my assignments, said, you've got to. Uh, 
get into one of those schools and be a student in the next uh, six weeks or you're out of there. So I had a cast on my leg, a broken ankle, and uh, I was going out in the afternoon breaking a little more of the plaster each day and, and running my laps around the airborne towers and I, I got myself in pretty good shape with the cast still on. And then the, the day before I was to report, it turned out that I, they sent me to ranger school first. The day that I reported to ranger school, I went into the local infirmary and the doctor cut off the, the cast. Wow. And, uh, and I went right to work. There was a question I wanted to ask you, and we kind of skipped ahead a little bit. When, when Granddad signed the papers for you when you were 15, how did you swing that? <laughs> what did, what it was, I mean, he had to be really reticent. To, you're his I, only son. Well, I told, I told him that I was really being pulled towards the military, that I had gotten very interested, wanted to make a career, and wanted to get commissioned, and wanted to work on all these things. I had, I'd set myself a program, not exact, but you know, to get as far as I could, National Guard, get into West Point. If I didn't get into West Point, get into OCS. So I, I talked to him about it and I said, um, you know, uh, technically I'm asking you to lie for me. Uh, but there's for no nefarious purpose. I, you know, I'm big enough, I'm strong enough, and I think I'm smart enough to go ahead into the Army, even though I'm only 15 and, well, actually, by the time I went in to active duty, I was uh, 18. 18, but going into the National Guard, 15. So, uh, I said, I was said, Dad, a, I, I, Was this know, a process of chipping away at Granddad, or what, did he, did he no, give he, you the nod he, right away? He said, okay. He, he didn't tell my mother because she she would not have liked it. That was my next question. Yeah, yeah. This, that you? was our, our little secret for a while, and I told I did uh, eventually straighten out the records with the army and say oh, there's a mistake there in my in my date of birth, you know, <laughs> and uh, I didn't get in any trouble, nor did he, but um, technically I was wrong to solicit his signature on that. Yeah. It was it was his. The, the particular piece of paper was his agreement that I could join because I was still a minor even if I was uh, 17 and so he had to sign but it also stated that uh, I was 17 which I was, I was not. It was two years, two years difference to my real age. Did it ever cause you a problem in the guard when you were a 15 year old amongst 18 and 19 year olds? No, no I, like I say I was big and I was yeah. I was serious about the guard, but I would say we had a great company. Uh, the captain who commanded our company had been a captain in the Korean War, come back. He was a very interesting guy, Count Robert de Marcellus, and uh, a Palm Beach socialite family, uh, and he loved the Army. He, he didn't have a good enough vision to qualify for a regular army commission. He was a reserve officer who served on active duty. And um, he said he would have stayed, but he didn't, he couldn't get that regular army commission. <coughs> I didn't um, know much about that at that point, but when I graduated from OCS at the end of uh, 1959, I was 19 years old. Um, I was told as an honor graduate, uh, you can be, you're eligible to be a regular army officer, but you can't get that till you're 21. So I went in with a uh, reserve date of rank of December 19th, 1959, and two and a half years later when I, when I uh, turned 21, that my date of rank was changed to the a regular army date of rank uh, for my birthday. And I get credit for all that time, but it changed uh, my time in grade, you know, uh, yeah. my seniority in grade. So was, was the guard a means to an end? Were you uh, always gunning toward 
going into the army, or were you oriented in that direction, and the guard was a way to, to get a foot in the door? I got interested uh, in the guard specifically because my friend, Don Cahill, uh, as I said, was an orphan, I actually lived in the armory and was a caretaker for the armory. And um, he was very involved in the National Guard too. And he liked to study the, the manuals and no more than the instructors for every class. So I got into that habit with him, of reviewing the Army manuals and every class we had in the Army or every weekend training, we were, we were uh, the most informed. We kind of took it seriously <laughs> and, and we enjoyed it. But you weren't looking at it when you went into the Guard as a way of stepping stone into the Army? No, it was, it was it? gradual yeah. as I, you know, first it was just to be in the National Guard. Secondly, I thought, well, I got promoted to sergeant. I said, well, I could go into the active army as a sergeant, you know, um, vertical transfer. I said, yeah, that's uh, a horizontal transfer, I should say. You, said, weren't, that, you weren't thinking necessarily long term in the guard? Not, a, not yeah. on entering, not on entering. I was thinking now, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm a sophomore in high school and wanted to go to summer camp up in Alabama. They, they went on uh, World War II style troop trains, hook up all the boxcars and, and set up a kitchen in one of the boxcars. It was about a uh, little more than a 24 hour trip to get to uh, camp in northern Alabama. And we played poker on the train. Oh, it was a, it was a great party. <laughs> we had a good time. And when we got up there, uh, Hotter than hell uh, in inland Alabama up, up north um, was really uh, taxing. But my friends and I, but now we had a couple other guys that were in our social circle from school or, or had been in the, on the school football team with me who were in the guard. And we all hung out together and, and uh, had a good time. Yeah. Did any of them follow a career path like yours? I mean, as, as extensive as yours? Or? Nobody, nobody stayed in. No, no, nobody made a career out of it like me. They were like four I, years and out. And I, I got some of that, some of my influence through um, the company commander, who had been, as I say, a company commander in the Korean War, um, and was and loved loved the army and everything military. Um, and I, I got inspired by him. He, he was real. And he had a first sergeant who uh, also had been a first sergeant in Korea uh, in, in combat. So there were, there were examples there along the way to look up to and learn from. He uh, captured the shaman and a, and a propaganda team, little girls that had been taught to sing and communist tunes and everything. We captured them freed them, I should say. They were being held, and we freed them. Um, let me see if I can find that picture for you. Oh, you liberated them from, from the EPA? From, from being held in a, in a VC camp, yeah. In VC. Uh, they were held to carry loads, and, and the girls were uh, uh, their trained propaganda team. They sang uh, communist songs in Rade. Huh. So they were and they had cute voices. When we brought them back in, we said, we said, sing for us. They said, only thing we know is the communist song. I said, sing the communist song. <laughs> Let's hear your voices. And they, they had sweet little voices. <laughs> so what, um, why would they, what is the purpose of capturing the shaman? It seems to me that would just create ill will, more ill will between the VC and the Rade, or did they have no, uh, care whatsoever whether they were alienating the Rade. No, they had they had very little concern. They were strong you arming know, them. They they were holding them physically, you know, capturing them at the end of a weapon and holding them to carry supplies and to uh, go get food from their villages for, for the communists. For the it kind uh, uh, is me talking to the village chief and and another. Uh, Rade who were training in the background and 
and basically I was just meeting with him to lay out, you know, what we were going to do. We're gonna we're gonna build a little clinic here. We're gonna have medicine. Uh, we're gonna need a place to park trucks. We're gonna need uh, a, a a building to sleep in. Um, I know you guys can build it in one day because you're you're very good at building with bamboo and. I said, uh, we'd like you to build that for us, and uh, then we're going to provide you with weapons. We're going to give you modern uh, fighting weapons to defend your village, and we're going to organize you and teach you how to do it. And they really had no way of protecting themselves. They couldn't have gotten weapons any other way. They had, they had none. They had, there were a few um, uh, crossbows still around. They, although the Vietnamese government had tried to seize all the crossbows and, and there were very few around. But there, those were a formidable weapon. They were like, it was as good as having a, oh, a 22 long rifle, you know, yeah. for about 100 yards, very accurate and enough, enough punch to take a man out. And I recall seeing a crossbow from the Central Highlands hanging on a wall in Bowie, Maryland, among other places. Yeah, it's hanging in Key Biscayne right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this is you inspecting the troops. Yes, the, these are villagers. This is not our, our strike force. This is not people we were training to be permanent military. But this is a, like the next village over from where we're living and we we're training them to defend their village. We went over with them, we sent our cadres, they built a bamboo fence, which they put around the village, and taught them how to build a fire arrow. Fire arrow, just a, a, a bamboo uh, arrow on a, rotating on a stick that had diesel rags wrapped to it. And when they were under attack, they could light that arrow, turn the arrow exactly towards where the enemy was coming from, and air commandos could deliver uh, a lot of good 500-pound bombs, 250-pound bombs. They they uh, had World War II um, fighter aircraft and and a B-26 bomber, and uh, they were pretty good. They uh, we uh, along about well, three months after we were there, we we caught a, a relatively large attack on one of our villages, which was only like uh, five or six kilometers from our base camp, and uh, the the attack went on all night, and we fought it off using the air commandos. The the air commandos flew up four different times, loaded the planes flew up it was only a 15 minute flight from from where they were they were keeping the planes they flew up and dumped the ordnance just using the fire arrow for direction and and uh, we killed the slew up we had uh, a lot of a lot of casualties from the use of air not so much on the ground but what kind of ordnance were they dropping uh, they had they had 250 pound bombs they had I think each sortie had one 500-pound bomb, and we had to decide whether or not to use it because it's expensive. It, the 500-pound has a big radius of damage, and we didn't want to inflict friendly casualties. Mm -hmm. So what we were trying to do is drop drop the the weapons outside the village, but where the attack was coming from, and uh, we were we were very successful in that. We we got uh, uh, a lot of KIAs. I don't remember the the number that night, but there were north north of twenty um, killed in action. He got off the helicopter, and he, <laughs> he was just a photographer. He's not really uh, he didn't write articles, but he said, "There's a story here. There's a story here." He <laughs> said, "Oh, I love it. There's a story here." <laughs> He went around uh, taking his pictures and never did get to write his story, but he but he sold the pictures to several publications. Uh, you, you tower over these these gentlemen, 
Um, was that universal? They were all about that height? No, there were a few that were taller, but um, but they were out. They were they were bigger than the Vietnamese. The the Rod A were bigger than the Vietnamese. But, really? Yeah, Vietnamese are slight, 110, 115 pounds. You know, wow. little little people. Um, the uh, people we worked with, uh, Mabrul, who was uh, my, I made him the indigenous battalion commander. He had been a, a sergeant major in the French army during the battle for Vietnam with the French. And uh, very, very bright, very nice guy. He, um, he was about 5'10 and, and stocky, probably weighed 200 pounds. So they were all sizes, mm -hmm. and and in fact, the ones that have resettled to the United States since the Vietnam War have all gotten pretty big. They just needed nutrition. Uh, Their genetics uh, support of. You know, I notice all these all of these are young men, uh, but there's one that's kind of half in frame on this picture, who looks like he's about Bradley's age. He looks like he's around 11 years old. Where the where the kids. When they got to a certain age, were they welcomed to um, participate in the defense of their? Camp? The village chief of each village decided who would participate and who not. We we didn't set an age, a minimum age, uh, and the village chiefs. Very few were as young as that that one you're looking at. I know what you're looking at, uh, and very few were that young. But there were a few. Um, not to be confused with the Christmas picture. Yeah. Yeah. That is a little guy. Yeah. Probably thirteen or fourteen, you think? Huh. So the village chief would allocate the personnel to you, based on his knowledge of the family. They have one boy, and so you're not going to get his this boy. And you would just ask a certain number of personnel, and he would deliver it. Yeah. And then and we would give them training. We would. Uh, did you reject anyone, or did you find a purpose for everyone who? Well, if, if if somebody uh, was had been sent who couldn't handle a weapon or was panicked about throwing a grenade or something, we probably would have rejected them. But I I think they all took to it. They, you know, their their culture was a hunting culture. Right. They go out from at eight or ten years old. They go out and hunt deer. You know. Yeah. Uh, so. They're, they're pretty well suited to the military life. So you just assess their, their viability as a soldier and then put your aces in their places and some would be a communication guy, some would be a whatever. Yeah. You're, you're pretty primitive form of communication to communicate with the planes with fire. Well, oh, that's, uh, that was to direct, to direct fire. We had, we had radio communications with the planes. We had uh, the regular infantry FM radio at that time. It was called the PRC-10. We could we could contact the planes uh, on that. They because they were air commandos. They had the army radio installed in their planes, so that we could use uh, the army frequency and uh, and get them. Elephants. Yeah. <laughs> We used them uh, primarily to haul rice. Um, we used them on the Cambodian border side. Uh, that, that is, I must confess, just a day walking through the village and I saw, <laughs> saw an elephant not being used for anything and I just took a picture. That's, that's not... Uh, it's a photo op. <laughs> it's just a photo op. It's a photo op. But we did use them, uh, particularly when we were operating up on the Cambodian border, we used elephants. You can, you can carry uh, uh, 300 kilos, 660 pounds of rice on an elephant. Wow! And uh, that's a lot of food. Who took that shot? Yeah, this is uh, this is the patrols that we sent out in the initial days around our camp. Uh, I was, what we basically tried to do was have two Americans accompany every patrol. Dual purpose. 
we were learning the terrain. We were learning how our our soldiers operated, um, and getting an idea what training they needed more. Uh, right. The f the first patrol you sent out was without any of the team members on it, right? Yeah. Without uh, Americans, and they they ran into uh, they had contact with uh, these. Exactly seat. right. Yeah. Um, this this one, I remember who was w with me. As I guess there was usually two Americans. Uh, a young sergeant named Jack Hamilton was with me. I later sent him to OCS. He became a full colonel in the okay. army. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he commanded when when we um, intervened uh, in the Caribbean to to recapture those students that the Cubans had taken prisoner. Uh, he commanded the second brigade of the 82nd Airborne Division. Oh wow! They had a successful career. Was was your whole team pretty strong? Very strong. Yeah, I had a good team. Had a wonderful first sergeant. Um, the, those teams have uh, such a um, storehouse of, of good military skill memory. Uh, the team sergeant had been in special forces since it had begun. You know, he, he had put 20 years in special forces and had participated in all kinds of operations. Um, that that kind of knowledge that gets passed down one on one provides for just the top notch people. Just the best. You so, can't you can't teach it all in a school. You give them a, give them a framework in a school, but then you get them out with the with the experienced people and they see how it's done. So so that was one of your first patrols. In, yeah, that in was capacity? like like a, a week into being there. Yeah. Um, I had, uh, obviously we weren't going very far, I had light equipment there. Uh, this is not a multi-day patrol, this I was see that. going out in the morning and coming back in the afternoon. But later on when our patrols went for two weeks at a time or three weeks, Full pack. we had a, had a much fuller pack with rice. Yeah, um, you're wearing an LBV here but you don't have any pack on that I can see. Right. Um, and you're carrying uh, what looks to be an M16. What what kind of weapons did, in that inspection, I was going to ask you, in the picture of you inspecting the troops, are they carrying Kalashnikovs? No, but uh, they're carrying several foreign-made weapons. This was, uh, we, the CIA opened the World War II cache, and they had um, they had um, submachine guns, primarily was the primary weapon, because these guys were light and they could carry a submachine gun. And uh, we had uh, Danish Madsen, <laughs> which was a 45, degree, 45 uh, caliber submachine gun. We had the U.S. Thompson, <laughs> pristine, beautiful. Tommy guns. Thompson's Tommy guns, yeah. Wow. They were a little heavy for the mountain yards, but well, we had a few. And that would be 45 ACP, right? 45 ACP, yeah. We had um, a Swedish K, uh, which was a very high quality submachine gun. We had uh, German MP40s. Um, and we had a lot of those called Schmeisers. Um, so so well, you had a hodgepodge of foreign guns we had, from we had that foreign were, guns, yeah. That were absconded in World War II. Mostly nine millimeter. That's what we had. And the ammunition we had was World War II as well. And there were a few problems with the ammunition being so old that it lost its punch. Particularly with the uh, Danish Madsen, which is it was a, a weapon, a machine gun, submachine gun designed uh, to use very cheap production methods and stamp them out, you know, thousands at a time. So um, if you got a, a couple of weak rounds in a magazine, what would happen is you fire a burst, maybe you realize or maybe you didn't realize that it didn't finish, you know, you, you left a round in the barrel. But if you realize that you uh, you were 
got the weapon off the line and cleared it. But if you didn't realize it, the, the second next fire would uh, blow the barrel up. I think we left off with the picture of, of you drinking non pay. Oh no, well, actually the, the Christmas, the wreath. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Christmas was kind of a, a funny thing because we didn't, we didn't have any gifts to give the kids, but they had sent us something that we totally didn't need, which was helmet liners. The helmet liner is the, the plastic insert for an army helmet. We didn't need them for anything, so uh, I said, why don't we make Christmas present of one helmet liner to each kid in the village. <laughs> and, uh, and then they marched around in and formation. They, and they, they got to be a pretty sharp marching platoon. <laughs> No, no, we did not give them weapons. <laughs> um, and then there's a, a photo of you drinking non pay and someone's putting the bracelet on you. Right. And that That's, was ceremonial as well, right? It, it is a ceremony. The drinking the non pay um, was only done in connection with the religion at that time. It was uh, animistic spirit worship and uh, the the shaman would call out the spirits for you, you know, spirit of the tall mountain, spirit of the of the forest fire, you know, spirit of the deep water, and uh, and call their blessing for you. And then the the bracelet was applied during the chants, and it was a religious uh, bracelet. They in their culture, as it was at that time. They wore the bracelet for a year after it had been placed on their wrist. And someone, because they had participated in multiple sacrifices, some people would have six or eight, even ten bracelets, some would have one. But um, Was there an animal sacrifice that went along with these ceremonies? Yeah, and the, the, there are the whole wash list of ceremonies. If you're the more important the ceremony, the more important an animal that's sacrificed. For a little daily uh, in the village thing like this, it was probably a chicken or an egg, or you know, it was it, there was a sacrifice, but I wasn't very focused on it. But a yak for they didn't bigger do ceremonies. That. And they didn't do it in front of you. I remember ox. And the, the first team who had arrived, the president of uh, Vietnam of South Vietnam, President Zim came up and they th they sacrificed a white elephant for him. Wow. It was the, the rarest, the hardest to, to find. And uh, that that was considered uh, maximum honor. Big A big sacrifice was a bu water buffalo. Sometimes uh, for some big event they would sacrifice a water buffalo. I never saw anything bigger than a water buffalo. Um, Although, as I, as I mentioned, elephants did get sacrificed occasionally. So the the Rade were um, extremely primitive. They didn't have they weren't utilizing wheels when you got there. They were using ox carts and things uh, like that, they, right? They were uh, basically dragging things on sleds. They were not even um, uh, using metal. You know, they 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 could you know they knew how to deal with. Piece of scrap metal and converted it into something, but but they were in their their typical building. What they built for shelters and what they built for stoves, what they built for their their homes. Nothing was made with metal. It's all all made with bamboo, um, stones, um, primitive construction materials. They were not. Um, highly advanced, but they had been a stable culture for a couple of centuries. They, all the hill tribes had a lot of a lot of similarities. There were about 40 hill tribes in South Vietnam, more in North Vietnam, and and more of course in Laos. And, all and of which would be considered mountain yards? Would be yes. All of which were mountain yards. Yes. And right. how many were Rade? What what was the the, right. the demographic of the Rade was the, was the single strongest group 
in the way of cultural influence. They, the Rade uh, had about 100,000 people in their, in their tribe, and that was the largest of the tribes. And the, the second largest would be Dega? Dega is actually a term that incorporates all mountain yards. Dega, uh, the word Dega uh, refers to actually the, the myth of the first raw day. Um, they had day and Ga, uh, man and woman, Adam and Eve, day and Ga. Um, and their myth of, of uh, creation started with day and Ga. And in the city of uh, Ban Mitut, the uh, Vietnamese called it, or Boon Matut. Boon was the Rade word for village. Interesting, it's the same in Thailand, it, the villages are Boon. So it might be a cultural overlap, you know, between the Thais and the Nam Yars. The, we do know that uh, the Rade came from the Polynesian Islands, migrated about 2,000 years ago, about the time of Christ. They migrated up into Vietnam before the Vietnamese migrated into, into Vietnam. So, so they were the indigenous people? From they were the indigenous people. Um, there's a tribe in the Philippines, I just, I know this only having caught the news when uh, Mount Pinatubo volcano erupted, they were interviewing indigenous people in the Philippines and I, all of a sudden I said, listen to these people, they're speaking around A. And, and the, the tribe in the Philippines had a, like a 90% overlap with Rade. Really? The numbers were all the same. Sa, Dwa, Lao, Pai, Ma, Nom Ju, Spun, Dabun, Bu. You have uh, just a shot of you in front of some traditional like uh, long houses there? That, that was a beautiful village. That's, that's uh, shortly after we arrived, I, uh, I hate to say that they didn't stay as pristine because more soldiers started going and coming and they put up put up little additions on the long houses that was a that was a beautiful uh, traditional village all with grass roofs and uh, is that the same village? yeah that's, that's that's the same place that's okay that's in uh, Boonta. T T A H. there are a lot of villages that sound alike for example there's a, a Boonda, and uh, a lot of the mountain yards who who got away from uh, Vietnam with the first load of, uh, of uh, people rescued to come to the U.S. were from Boon Da. So when I tell them I'm, I'm from Boon Da, they sometimes, I have to describe it in more detail uh, so that they know where I'm from. Movie night. Yeah, with the, in Bambi Tuit, which was about 25, 30 miles from where we were, the biggest city around. The army had an advisory team, and the advisory team would get movies about, come in for about a week, and then they'd have to send them back. Well, they showed them on the weekend, then we made a deal. We swapped enemy weapons for the movies. <laughs> <laughs> we would get the movies for three or four days and then take them back down by the time they had to go, go back on the weekend. Was this, uh, uh, I mean, it's obviously it's a morale booster for your team, but uh, what what did the Vietnamese, what did the Rod A think of their first movie? Yes. Do you remember reactions? What they, what they, yeah, I remember, and what they reacted to, they'd never seen a movie. You know? Right, it's magic. Yeah, this, is, this was all magic, and, and they had never imagined um, a city with hundreds of thousands of cars going by. Oh wow! I one of the early ones that I I noticed there was a street scene in New York City with all the cars, and it was, and the crowd went ooh ooh <laughs> ooh. That's great. <laughs> That's great. Uh, I remember them them saying uh, all big cars, all big cars. Yeah. yeah. So so movie night must have been a hell of a treat. For yeah, it, it 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 didn't necessarily come every week, but every time we could 
we could pull it off. Every time we got there and they had a movie that they'd already seen, we'd borrow it and yeah. bring it out. And then you have an aerial uh, picture which you uh, put the uh, labeled the the building. So yeah, this, this is just I, I took the picture actually. Took it out of a, an L nineteen, a little observation plane, and uh, and then I wrote on the photo what the function of the different buildings that we had built. You can see here that we're kind of moved in integrated into the village, the old village. The older buildings show is more grayish. Our show, uh, because the, the grass was freshly cut, is more white. Um, but we're still the same kind of construction. We had a, we had a pretty good camp. We had um, you know a, a deep bunker for the, our headquarters and communications uh, with lots of overhead support logs. Uh, the camp, the camp was pretty efficient. Um, they, one thing you can see here, there's um, like an inner perimeter here. You can see it in a sandbag wall that runs around the interior of the village and, and where the Americans were sleeping and living and everything. So uh, that was. Um, and, that was, uh, in case our walls got penetrated, we would form up for a last stand at the, at the sandbags. That was, your, that was your fallback, last fallback. Um, now, that, that camp was built entirely after your arrival, right? Entirely, entirely. Well, this is the camp you built, and the, you built an airstrip at that camp. Oh, this? Yeah? Now this is uh, the camp you're looking at. Was not from the first tour. It's from the second tour. I see. That's when I moved. And that camp. would have been 62, 63, 63, 64. Okay. 63, 64. Um, when I moved moved the camp all the way up to the northern limit of our province to get astride the mountain chain that was that was the, really the main line of communications. And um, once we moved up there, we had constant action. That is it's also in 65, when the Americans committed the first combat troops. That is where the first big battle was fought. Hmm. The Battle of Ia Drang, and, uh, the 173rd Airborne Brigade fought a hell of a battle there. They, they uh, were practically overrun. They held out and, and dispersed the communist regiment that was there. But uh, it was a major, a major battle. Right in this, the same area. From where I, that camp was, the Iadrang fight was only like five kilometers north of there. There's a, there's a picture here of some lovely young uh, villager <laughs> ladies, I guess. This What's is, the? This is the propaganda team. These these girls had been. Uh, those were the ones that were communist drinking. Yeah, they had been taught communist, communist songs, and uh, and they were uh, an entertainment package. They're uh, they're cute little things, probably fourteen, fifteen. I don't know, but they had they had beautiful voices. And in general, uh, Roddy girls can sing. I mean, <laughs> uh, all the way through our experience with this, even working with. Uh, Refugees in 2000, 2001, notably, notably good singers. Were and, were they bought off on the communist propaganda, or were they no, uh, no. they were playing the part that they had to they, play? They were playing the part they had to play. Yeah. They, they, they were, were being, captured. You know, they were know. being used as human mules, and yeah, they did whatever they had to do to just yeah. keep keep on living another day. Yeah. Here up on a on a hillside, smoking a cigar. Oh yeah, well, there's the only significance really to the cigar is that's how we handled hunger. You, we could not carry enough food for 14 days. You, I mean, what we did eventually, the Americans, uh, we could carry enough food to cook rice one time a day. And um, so we would have a 
We would cook a hot rice in the morning, eat half of it, and then uh, at noontime we'd smoke a cigar to get that hunger down a little bit, and at night we'd eat the cold rice so we was, didn't have to make a fire. Was the size of your fire a concern, or did you dig Dakota, do Dakota fires? No, it was very, very much a concern. That's, we, um, we generally cooked in the morning right. because we were going to be moving, you know, the, the smells and the smoke weren't going to give us away. That's know? what prompted my question, it's yeah. smart to cook your afternoon meal. Yeah, that's why we ate a, a cold dinner, uh, you know. Uh, we carried, uh, for a long time, we carried a can of, of French sardines and tomato paste Ugh. to go with our rice. Wow. <laughs> Could, couldn't get sea rations, couldn't, you know, couldn't, couldn't get anything better to eat. So we bought these uh, sardines and tomato paste and we would open one uh, for two people, you know, put it on the, put it on the rice. Mm -hmm. It wasn't delicious, but <laughs> it was better than nothing. It was probably very appreciated. When you get hungry. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, um, where was this taken, do you know? Yeah, I do know where that's taken. That, the unusual thing about that, it, uh, my area of operation was generally on from Highway 14 to Cambodia and from the town of Bamituit to the province line, which this was the mountains. Is the second tour? This is the, the second tour. Yeah. But um, in this case, we had gone east. We crossed the highway and we had gone east about 20, 25 miles east because we had pursued uh, an infiltration unit that we'd run into, had a quick shoot, shoot, no casualty encounter with them, and then we followed them for two days. So we were over quite a ways from our normal terrain. I remember that, that open hillside. And over where we normally operated, we had more woods. And that's kind of unusually open. It looks very open. Um. Then we see a cot with. Uh... That's my home sweet home. Oh, yeah, that's, that's it. That's my bed. That's your. Uh, uh, we had we had a uh, regular locker beneath you. Regular cots and the uh, camouflage pillow that I have there is really a blanket. That we had uh, poncho liners. Yeah. And um, made up. I had a regular. Whoobies. Whoobie. Well, yeah. <laughs> and a regular um, uh, wool blanket too. That was it. Was pretty comfortable, and you can see all all the shoes under the bed ready to go. <laughs> she ordered our food for us. It came up from the lot. Uh, sometimes a load would get lost if it was kidnapped, but usually it got there. And then we would send a truck in, or a couple of trucks to pick it up. Uh, we, we got all the fresh vegetables, a little bit of chicken, a little bit of, uh, not so much beef, but a little, uh, little bit of lamb. They would get you whatever they could. Whatever, whatever they could get. Yeah. We were feeding, uh, you know, more than, more than a thousand, it was like a thousand two hundred regular troops. We weren't feeding the villagers. The villagers took care of their own food. They had, they had their fields and they had their farms, but we were we were feeding all the soldiers. We got over a thousand. What what was life like for a Rade soldier? Uh, was he was he able to stay with his family? And or do, they, did they have separate barracks for the? They they had, their custom was once we got them trained and settled, they would send for their family. So the family would come. They would they would dig a foxhole. Not just for them, but for their family. Really? And so we had the families living around the perimeter. and um, They were outside the sandbags? They were outside the sandbags. They, uh -huh. were, they were in the first perimeter. Yeah. And uh, we, never, uh, we never lost any family. We had a lot of, a lot of sporadic attacks, lob mortar shells. We never lost any family on that. Okay, I've got a picture here of what looks like a pretty big feast. 
with uh, your team assembled around the table and uh, some Vietnamese yeah, this around is, you. The Vietnamese uh, food contractors. Uh, is this the party same couple? For us. Yeah. Yeah, they're uh, they're the couple at the back of the picture. Right. Uh, I'm not taking this picture. I'm actually first seat at the right, <coughs> and the guy at the far end, Sergeant Major Williamson. He's my communication sergeant. Yeah, this poor guy on the left front of the table uh, was. Uh, totally disabled and finished out his life in the VA hospital. The second guy, I can't run down, this is an Irishman from San Francisco, Kilpack, but I never was able to run him down. The third guy uh, is a buck sergeant. I actually had to fire him. I had to send him back to Okinawa. He had a mental problem constant pressure. PTSD, right in, right while he was on the mission. Um, yeah, most of the team is there. I can name, name them all. Um, yeah. Ted Cummings, who was my executive officer on my second tour, seated, seated right next to me in this that's, room. That's a name I've heard a lot. Yeah, I, I couldn't yeah. tell you who he is, I've, but I've, I've heard kept, you mention his name many times. I've kept in touch with Ted. Yeah, he's a great guy, a very an interesting guy. Yeah, so, I used to, used what to, was this meal? Was this just a, this a was, meal? This was her saying thank you to us for our business. Uh, she said, "How many people can you bring?" I said, "Well, I, I can't quite bring them all, but I can probably bring about ten. She said, "Bring them, and I, I will give them a." proper Chinese meal. Huh. She was a uh, Chinese Vietnamese. Uh, the, the top business people tended to be Chinese in Vietnam. Who's this young guy here? Oh, that's a stud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's after, oh, I know, it's during smoking the cigar. Again, this goes with that other picture. Uh, it's the same we're, spot? We're east of the highway. Um, and the area is much more open, you know, it didn't have the jungle. Um, it, in this picture, if you look through as far as you can see, you see a road going out to the horizon and some hills on the left side. That, that was our normal area of operations. This, this was actually uh, an exception. Uh -huh. Yeah, it looks, the, it looks sparse. Um, as far as the trees, but in my mind, I'd always thought that that had been from ordinances or that place had been leveled at some point. But I don't think so. No, no. I think I think probably the topography is changing there, and it it, it was up a little higher, and you didn't get as much jungle growth. I think I think the. What, what was the elevation in the Central Highlands when you're up in a mountain like, or up in a hill like that? Yeah, well, at, at our base camp, uh, we were at, tw we were at uh, 1,200 feet, not very high. And when we climbed up the mountain just north of us, uh, Chuprong, I think we got up to 2,400 or something like that. They aren't really big mountains, they're, they're more large hills in that area. The big, big mountains, the rugged mountains, are uh, about a hundred miles further north. Here you are shaking the hand of uh, what appears to be a Rod A soldier. Is this just a general inspection? Yeah, this is. This was actually we organized uh, awards day. We were giving awards. Um, the the fellow uh, standing next to me is my mountain yard uh, battalion commander, Mabru, uh, one of a great friend. When I went back, to, I went back to Vietnam in 1996 trying to see him. I got to his village 
and he had just died six months before. Oh, uh, sad. So I did get to see him again. Uh, and, and the guy in the camouflage uniform who's receiving an award is Rade. Uh, that's E. John Nie. And E. John was uh, one of the best. He was a company commander for me. I had him as a company commander. And he was getting an award for bravery there. Were the awards. Uh, um the same as the awards that, that are sanctioned through the U.S. Army? Are they, were they, we, I mean, we, could they have the potential of earning a Bronze Star or it, something it like that? It uh, was not easy to get them officially recognized because they didn't want to treat them like they were U.S. troops, you know. The, the, the politic was deniability. I mean, yeah, they're, they're fighting for us, but they're doing it for their own reasons. And, you know, we're not, we're not making them do it. So they didn't want to give U.S. awards, so we kind of made up some awards, you know. Yeah, and they had their own uniforms that were separate from yeah from uh, U.S. Army uniforms. And what? Um, okay, let's back up to the, your your first tour. Your uh, you uh, you've been briefed at the U.S. Embassy, and um, your you're flown into, what was it? Bambi to it. Bambi to it. And then from there, what, a convoy to the village? Where yeah, to... from there, actually we went to the the one existing Special Forces camp. We went to uh, um, uh, Now. At Now, we got a few more briefings and a little more. My, my uh, weapon sergeant sat down with the the weapon sergeant from the team that was already there learned about the weapons that we had, all these World War II uh, surplus weapons, learned how to fix them, or if he didn't know, and learned uh, you know, what to watch out for in the way of vulnerabilities on them. And every, each, each guy sat down with his counterpart. They had a little hospital going there, so my medics went in and worked with them and, uh, for two or three days and kind of saw how they handled it. Uh, we were we were getting like on the job training, but it didn't last long. It was like two or three days, and then uh, when they picked somebody to be our interpreter, and they weren't very good interpreters, but we, they picked somebody who had a few words of English, you know, and uh, and we loaded up a truck and and headed out. Uh, we had we had already picked the location from a map reconnaissance. It turns out we didn't we didn't go far enough. We we went trying to be in the handprint that we we've been given in Saigon. We went uh, due north, and we went like ten kilometers north. Well, the the sphere of influence of one special forces team turned out to be twenty, thirty, forty kilometers. You didn't have to have a team every 10 kilometers. Uh, the intensity of the combat wasn't that high at that point in the war, you know. You had small groups wandering around in there. So uh, we hadn't been there long when we realized we, we had uh, built up um, more, than, more than we needed. Um, they decided to take half the team and put it up on the Cambodian border on the main highway, which was Ban Don was the the name of the the village. And I I stayed with the other half, the first half, at Boon Ta. And we we went heavily into the training mission, both for our strike force, which was our permanent military people, and for village defenders. Um, and we kept that going oh, three, four months until we had our we had our force built up to what we needed. Um, we we wound up with two hundred uh, main force two two hundred they called them commando commandos but two hundred they got the full training. 
and we're operating with special forces leadership and we tra and we trained about uh, 600 village defenders who got a very low level of training just how to fire clean their weapons and uh, what to do if a fight started got to get down in their hole and and how how potent an army did you have there well it got it got ever more potent uh, like i say my first tour we finished up with uh like we had had like a quarter of the province defended with with villagers and we could we could also um roll those out a little bit we would put put out 10 20 armed villages in front of us and then little by little as we got confidence we take the weapons away from the ones that were closest back towards us and move them out into a new village and train a new. The, uh, the concept was to put ink blots on the page and, and keep expanding them. Right. So, um, was the net, um, was the net uh, uh, of this whole process that the Rod A ceased to be used as mules after a time? Or were the VC still Subjugating them, and that was that was like a lesser included mission to get them back from that. Right. That was, uh, the, I'm I'm thinking of their motivation. I I'm thinking of good point because that's that's exactly what it was. They felt this strong need to release their people from, you know, from being in this uh, horseman role of carrying right. supplies. So that that became a, a bigger priority with us as we realized how important it was to our troops. Right. And they were, I mean, they were uniformed to a man that, that they were pro-American and they were not going to work with no Vietnamese, not from the North, not from the South. Mm -hmm. That was a little bit of a political problem for us because theoretically they are working for us. They're allies of the South Vietnamese government. But uh, they, they didn't see it that they way. They don't like Vietnamese. Yeah. <laughs> the Vietnamese have cheated and stolen and taken their land and, and continue to do it. And uh, there's no love lost. So sort of like uh, the, the Native American plight in, in the United States, is it, can it be likened to that? Very similar. Yeah. Very similar. Yeah. We, uh, treaties and broken treaties. And, and so yeah. they were distrustful of, of the South as well as the North, huh? Yeah, we um, we didn't have so much broken treaties or broken agreements, but uh, until the very end. We, we, we broke the most basic understanding of trust. When Vietnam fell, we, we didn't get any, any mountain yards out. We got some South Vietnamese troops out. We got, but for, uh, I think the only, I know one guy who, who got out, and he got out because he had, <laughs> an interesting guy, uh, he had worked his way up with me. He had been, and he was young and smart. So he got the job from me of checking our food orders. He had to go to Bambi to it, to the city, stay there and check. When they loaded the food, he had to check and make sure it was really on there and he and he partly that job there was a CIA resident agent in Bemi to it and he got to doing favors for the for the resident agent and by uh, time three years had gone by he was working directly for the CIA oh wow and, he was an and, asset pardon he was an asset as an asset oh yeah well he, he became in the remaining years of the war he became such an asset that he was uh, in the Ministry of Public Affairs in charge of all all things to do with mountain yards for the South Vietnamese government, wow. national government. So he got out because of his government position. Hmm. He, he, uh, he was a good friend of mine and uh, knew, him, knew him very well. Hmm. Been to see him many times since he settled here. He's, he he's in North Carolina? In Seattle. Seattle. Yeah, he's the head of a community there. About There's about 60, 70 mountain yards in Seattle. 
and he settled there. How many are there in North Carolina now? Ooh, uh, depends how you want to count them. You going to count the kids born here? I, I suppose, yeah. yeah. I mean, are we up to over a thousand? Yeah. 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 If you count, if you count the kids who are born here, you probably have uh, ten to fifteen thousand in North Carolina. Wow. Uh, you you had three tours in Vietnam, and you had three Bronze Stars. Were they all from each tour? Yeah. Each tour you were awarded a Bronze Star? What is a Bronze Star for? Um, bronze Star can be for exceptional service in combat. That's, that's basically what it's for. Um, it can be for valor. If there's an individual uh, citation for valor, it has a V on it. I don't know, I don't know the V. That's um, minor just attaboys. Good job. Good, good attaboys. Good job. <laughs> uh, now, you, you told me once, I think, and again, this might be something I have wrong, but you, you were, you, your injury to the, with a mortar fire, mortar fire going off near you would have um, given you a purple heart. You would have had to put in that for yourself, though. Right, right. right. So you didn't do that. Yeah, same thing for the air medal. You're, for every five times you flew in the theater of operations, you could put yourself in for an air medal. I, I know some people who've got 35 air medals, you know, uh, but I never put myself. I never put myself in for anything, you know. If I have to apply for it, I'm not going to apply for it, you know. Uh, but uh, I've got a um, I got a Vietnamese award that has a incorrect but fancy citation for valor. I got a. Um, the Cross of Gallantry First Class. And uh, the, the citation that goes with it almost sounds like I tore the enemy apart with my bare hands. <laughs> let, let his team <laughs> into the secret of nesting area of the enemy. <laughs> Disable them. <laughs> we were talking about your first tour though, and your first contact came almost immediately. Yeah. After your first tour, you sent out a patrol without any team members, and they took contact. Actually, Ebong, who was the Vietnamese special forces sergeant, he he was a professional, but he wasn't a U.S. professional. Yeah, he was. He was with them. They they uh, they ran into they they killed two on that first patrol. First day we were there. Did they take any casualties? No. No. Were they generally were they generally lopsided affairs when you had contact? Uh, yeah, generally, generally, uh, they never got the drop on us. So we usually inflicted some casualties on them, and, and uh, we we had casualties, but there was one bad one. We were operating. I think I think it was the second tour. We're operating up on the Cambodian border, and uh, they had uh, 90 millimeter mortars, and they they got a very good uh, barrage of mortars off against one of my platoons. Uh, had uh, had like eight eight people badly wounded, mm -hmm. a couple died from it. Uh, was your was your camp ever threatened? Camp was threatened, but it never. Never had a full a full size attack on it. You know, we had a harassing fire. We had someone come in, you know, a sniper fire four or five times and then be gone. Or, or we had uh, a rocket fired into the camp and, and they're gone. Did you see that as probing fire to see what your reaction would be, or did you see it well, as a sure. precursor to something had, bigger? They had to assume that's it? what it was. It's the, trying to figure out what the response was and how how it would be played. Yeah. And of course, you've got very little choice when that happens than to go through with your plan because you're never going to be able to communicate with all your troops. You've got to have 
on the first firing, this is what happens. You know, continued firing, this is what happens. You know, report to here. Uh, so they probably got a good look at what our our defensive strategy was. So you had fairly you you had rally points to to fall back to yeah. and yeah. to regroup. Yeah. Assembly, assembly areas primarily to get people into the best defense. Um, there were always half of the positions on the outer perimeter were always occupied. If the, I mean, the soldier had to be awake and had to be in his hope, but he might have his family there. He might be cooking dinner. He might, you know, but he was, but he was there with his weapon. How long would those shifts last? Man, you talking yeah. 12 hours or three days? No, 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 no. You don't try to get 12 hours out of them uh, on that kind of constant use. Try to get like six hours, you know, and let them, let them sleep half the night. Now, um, and how did that They work? could go in when we were in the field, you know, when we uh, took one company or two companies in the field, 120 or 240 people then you could count on them to go all night. We, but we would lay out, if we were in a hot area, we would lay out a night ambush, and they would have to stay awake with the ambush. Um, sprang uh, the night ambush twice, uh, killed a mail carrier, didn't kill a mail carrier, shot a mail carrier with a big, big bag of, of uh, VC mail. Uh, was was kind of interesting. And, we got a lot of intelligence from reading the mail, you know, about how bad the conditions were, how, how little they had to eat, and we got a lot out of it. But um, that guy uh, got shot in the liver, and we took him back to our camp, and I asked my medic, I said, any chance to keep this guy alive? And he said, he said, well, we can't send him back to the enemy, too. They don't want enemies. They're not going to treat enemy soldiers in the 23rd Division. And he said, uh, we've, got, we've got plenty of antibiotics here. I can treat them here, and we can see what we can do. So that turned into a big, big deal because they had to debreed the wound. He opened, three of us helped him, you know. Opened up the guy, got the liver in, in, in one of those little silver pans, you know, and cut off all the little frat uh, shattered ends and tried to get it as clean as possible, put it back together. We, we packed it in antibiotic powder to get a real quick start and then put his liver back. It was still connected on both ends, put, put the liver back, and closed them with a few big stitches, just just enough. We, we figured there'd be swelling and didn't want to try to close them all the way up. And, uh, and he lived, and he lived. Was that your only instance of uh, surgical assistant? No, episiotomies. What's that? Episiotomies. Uh, we did, we did uh, a lot of deliveries and where the woman was particularly small, we'd cut the little 45 degree angle cut there to assist. That's a physiotomy. That's minor surgery. But uh, we did that. What else? Surgical. There were others. I wasn't involved in them. Uh, the, the medics did a few things, you know. One guy had a real bad skin cancer and uh, they excised it completely and sewed up. He was fine. He never. Didn't get skin cancer again. Uh, they're, they're pretty good medics. Um, I used to used to say, trying to explain it to people, that they're like um, the level of a turn of the century, 19th to 20th century country doctor, and that they could do what that country doctor could do. You know, they can they can operate. They can. Uh, yeah. Reduce an abscess. They can, they can, you know, get rid of a boil. They can, they can do uh, basic 
setting bones and that kind of thing. They were, they were pretty good. I liked to cross train on it. So when I, when, if I was not doing something else and there was a, a case going on in the hospital, I'd go down and help. Um, <clears throat> so back to the first tour, <clears throat> you, um, your patrol was out. The first patrol you sent out uh, took fire, came back, and after that you established that uh, team leaders would be with the, the patrols at all time. And you were on the second or third uh, patrol? There was a first, it may have been, I don't remember exactly because it may have been like a week later, we were, we were moving the patrols out as each day we go further, you know. I remember the first day my Mabrul, who was the uh, former French soldier, he said, he said, Captain Regan, we're going 10 kilometers. When I was in the French Army, we went 100. <laughs> I said, we're going to go 200, but we're, we're going to learn it a step at a time. Anyhow, in the second week uh, being up there, I took a patrol from an outer camp. In other words, we, we went by truck. 10 miles or so before we started walking. And uh, then we got we got shot at just leaving the village that we started from. They, they must have had a lookout there. I don't I don't think we got more than a couple of wake up shots, you know. Nobody got hit or anything. Um, but that's when I got tackled and, and mobbed and thrown to the ground. <laughs> and the first yeah. thought first thought really was Oh my God! Somebody didn't check these people out there. They really were the enemy. Not so. They were. These are your own troops. Your covering own troops me with their body them. until the, they saw where, where the shooting was coming from. I both uh, had to chew them out and and thank them. <laughs> so you can't do that. <laughs> I'm I'm a soldier. I'm a professional soldier. I'm I'm here to go with you into battle. And. Uh, my life is not worth any more than yours. You know, your life is maximum value. My life is also maximum value. We're the same. We're, we're comrades in arms. What, um, what percentage of the time did patrols encounter contact? Well, I'd say most every patrol that went out found somebody. They may have, may have had a, a shooting engagement, may have just seen somebody. Uh, May have just tracked somebody, you know, found the tracks. But uh, almost every patrol found evidence of activity. Quite often, had a light skirmish. You know, uh, there's some some pictures in my. I got a big book of photos and pictures there of a a guy crossing the main highway, Highway 14. It's a dirt highway, but. They were crossing it, and they got their feet wrapped with rags. They're walking in these big packets of rags, so as not to leave uh, footsteps, you know. And one guy died with his rags on. <laughs> he, uh, <clears throat> there were a lot of uh, techniques that we learned about. I told you about the. Uh, the ones on the tuk tuk, bring food. That was in the second tour. But they were they were on a big motor scooter, you know, with, with a back on it, and, and hauling food, hauling bottles of oil and stuff for the gorillas. Um, there were a couple times I held back where I would have been justified in shooting. That was one I didn't. There were women on the back of that cart, and I didn't know, are they just happened to be there, or are they part of the scheme? Anyhow, I let that, that motor scooter get away with a couple of warning shots. But you also found where their drop was. Yeah. 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 Well, we were forever completing the map, you know, where, <laughs> where all these little paths converged. And that was um, at up on the border of... Doc Lock and, and Pleiku uh, states. So, so my understanding with special forces is you're very self-directed. You're you're allowed to you're your own. 
you establish your own parameters and all that, but you're given very vague, uh, kind of broad instructions, and then you're left to uh, with very broad directives. But was there ever a time um, during your first campaign that there was a, a change in the directive from upstairs to, to the to the overarching, you know, mm -hmm. to the to the big picture, or, or was yeah, your was. intercepting VC supply line uh, was that did that become the main focus? There. There was always somebody in some position who wanted to glorify an operation by having three different camps participate and 500 soldiers, and, and they were all failures. You know, we never really, we made contact, but uh, the biggest operation we, uh, we pulled wound up getting six Americans killed, you know, in that airplane that was shot down. Mm -hmm. Um, including our commander, you know, and that was that was coming from uh, your your command, your different command, uh, right. the command coming downhill to it was you. Coming, it was coming downhill, and and uh, you were a lieutenant in your first. I tour was a lieutenant. I, I age was a, a captain, age uh, twenty two. Twenty two, and uh, I was a captain in my second tour, 20, 24 years old. So <clears throat> when your first tour ended, how did you get word that you were being taken out? All right, well, we were on a rotation. We knew when we went that we had a six-month tour. We didn't know, uh, you know, we, we knew we'd go back to Okinawa. Our, our home unit was the first Special Forces group in Okinawa. So we got got the word, pack up, you know, we're going to pick you up and bam me to it on, on this date and we're going to uh, take you take you to meet the C-47 in, in uh, Saigon what, or the uh, C-130. What are your feelings uh, when you're, <coughs> as you're leaving country? Yeah. You've got a lot of emotional investment in training uh, these Rod A. I'll tell you the truth, I never felt uh, squeamish about contact. But at, at the time we rotated back, I did, because we knew we had had intelligence for two or three weeks about a big unit, battalion plus, towing around artillery with elephants that was trying to get in position to attack our camp. We'd had this intelligence over and over. And uh, so I was with a with something called a short timer's attitude when you're when you're down to the last uh, week of your stay or something, you, you're you bound to have the feeling, wouldn't it be a shame if I got clocked on my last three days or something? Yeah. So I, I was actually nervous about, about contact because I knew this potential big attack was out there, that troops were in the area, we're getting, we're getting reports every day. I mean, people say, you know, 100 people went through between this village and this village. And, 200 people went through here, you know. We got we had very good information, very good. So your second tour, you got to pick your own team, which you picked the same team you had in the first tour. No. No, I didn't have the same team. I had the same mission. I was going to the same area, working with the same uh, mountain yard people. Oh, But okay. my American team were all new. Uh, I had to, while I was uh, doing a headquarters job for a year, I had to pick out the people that came through who I thought were excellent. I really had uh, uh, a great choice. Really some wonderful people came through. And I've got a, I got a great uh, uh, team sergeant, first of all. Let him help me pick the rest. Um, Sergeant Major Wells, who was my, my team sergeant, had uh, more than 20 years experience in Special Forces, had served all over the world, knew everybody, and uh, was a tremendous help in picking the people that I wanted. He knew, you know, who would be uh, competent, uh, but he could also tell you who would be competent 
and be a little bit of a pain in the ass. And while well, this other guy was really cooperative, and so we we really got a, a great team. Uh, I give a lot of the credit to Sergeant Major Wells. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. He he got he retired from the army. He had a a real estate company, and one day when he was uh, leaving work, uh, four black guys jumped him and uh, and beat him into unconsciousness. He lived he lived for uh, a couple of months in the hospital, semi awake. I got to go see him. I got to got to visit him in the hospital. I thought he was going to make it because he uh, he's one of those guys that. Self-discipline. He was in the hospital. He was working his muscles all the time, working his arm to get to get the movement back. He he had uh, he had some brain damage and uh, didn't survive it. Unfortunately, great man. Really, when did, really when did great. this happen? My uh, in California? They no in in here. Fort Bragg, North Carolina, uh, or off base in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Wow. He had an office there. He was coming out. Five, six o'clock in the evening. And I don't he's know how. Leaving this... his office, locking it up, and these four yeah, black guys get off, get off. jumped him and just pummeled him and and left him quite damaged. Wow. Uh, yeah, sad. Uh, I've, I've I've lost a couple of team members, uh, unforeseen. Uh, you know, post post military problems. Mm -hmm. um, anyhow, the. The second tour, the biggest difference from the first was, in the first, all of us were starters, learning Vietnam, learning the mountain arts, learning. Now there's some precedent for. Now, many of us on on my second team had had a tour, not necessarily together. We we had been on different teams, but we had had a tour down there, and we were going back for a second or a third. Uh, so everybody's in a groove. Everybody knows. Everybody's trained. Everybody's uh, really ready to go. It uh, it was very satisfying professionally to work with uh, these guys. Uh, were you were exclusively working with Rod A. Still? Well, not exclusively. We were principally working with the Rod A. Tribe, or as they say, E Day. E D E. But the French call them Rade, and that kind of stuck with English speakers too. But I, I really call them E Day because that's what they call themselves. Um, they're. Uh, hey, Grandpa! I, I think my finger is getting hot. Oh, <laughs> that's my grandson, <laughs> who I hope someday is interested in, in this material. <laughs> uh, yeah, I. I um, I found it uh, just terrific to have a team that was so professional, and I didn't have to give a lot of detailed instructions. You know, we we deployed, we had a plan. Uh, I could tell my my operations sergeant, you know, we're gonna uh, we're gonna move the first and third company down the road to uh, uh, mile marker sixty. And we're going to, uh, and we're going to bring. We got a team in the field, on the left of the road. We're going to bring them over tomorrow to join up, and and they would take care of all the coordination. They would get the map coordinates and the messages, and and uh, send them out, and everybody would be at the right place and the right time to, to start the operation. Well, we now had in the second tour instead of having 200 full-time troops in our little army. We had 500, and uh, it was a it was a, a pretty good military force. We had uh, one 4.2 inch mortar. We had four 90 millimeter mortars, which is a lot of firepower. We had uh, uh, machine guns, submachine guns, uh, tons. Still using primarily the World War II surplus weapons. Uh, we, had, we had decided that the M2 carbine, the U.S. light weapon, was the most appropriate weapon for the mountain yards. 
if if you train them and gave them a submachine gun, no matter how many times you emphasize controlling the rate of fire, you would um, you would wind up having them empty a whole magazine. Uh, you know, no fire control. So we started giving them the M2 carbine, which had automatic, but it didn't. It didn't. Uh, it was a kind of automatic. It felt like a rifle, so you you pull the trigger for one round, two rounds, three rounds. You uh, you didn't fire off a burst. It was also light. The carbine is uh, about uh, seven pounds, and they could carry it with a lot of ammo. So the M2 carbine became the favorite weapon, and uh, behind behind the M2 carbine, the old the nine millimeter. Uh, uh, fully automatic uh, submachine guns were still the second second most popular. We had we had a little of everything, and they and the troops have gotten better and better at fighting. You know, they they had learned to be soldiers with us. Rare exception, one or two who had experience with the French. You know, and had prior military experience. Very rare. But um, now everybody had experience with the Americans in one one camp or another. All of the the Rade also started to work with the Jirai tribe. Jirai tribe is the next biggest tribe to the Rade, and they're just to the north. Uh, and as we worked our way into Pleiku province, we found more and more Jirai villages. Uh, in fact, we moved our camp. Um, up to the border, kind of which kind of separated the Rade and Jirai, we moved into a little village called Boon Bring. Boon Bring was actually it was kind of a mix of Rade and Jirai, but it was really a, technically a Jirai village into which some Ide families had married. Uh, and it was typical on the border of any area. Uh, mountain yard tribal area, they tended to mix at their borders and intermarry. And so they they understood each other. The languages were were similar but not the same. Was that the result of the mountain yards splitting into these different groups or were they different migrant groups altogether? No, it was it was people who who lived uh, ten miles apart and decided to marry the girl from the next village. You know, the next village happened to be Jirai, and they were, they were Ide, but... Uh, they had common ancestry? They, yeah, they came, yes, they had, they had a uh, common ancestry. They're, they're, the Mountain Yard tribes have two major uh, lineages. The, uh, uh, the more advanced of the tribes came out of the Pacific, came out of Polynesia, migrated up through the Philippines, Malaysia, onto the Indochina Peninsula, probably through Thailand, and found their way by land some 2,000, 2,500 years ago uh, into the hills in Vietnam, uh, where there were no Vietnamese at that time. There were, there were Thai, there were Cambodians, there were Hindus, but, there, but the Vietnamese didn't show up until uh, about 1000 AD. And they were pretty much the sole occupants of the Central Highlands, right? They were. They, they were. They managed to fight wars with each other. They, uh, there was a, a bloody period of, of tribal warfare and some of those um, uh, rivalries still exist. You have to be kind of careful, like with the Rade and the Jirai. They fought many battles over the years and we were combining them into the same same units, you know. I had I had in my uh, battalion of 500 main force soldiers. I had a company that was commanded by a Jirai, and two companies that were commanded by a Day. And uh, there was jealousy, you know. If if I was asking uh, the uh, Jirai company commander to go into an area that he considered not enough of a challenge for him, and I was asking the 
rocky day to go to a diff more difficult area, they would have a little fight. <laughs> he had the right to get a to get as difficult an assignment <laughs> as his brothers, because <laughs> they because they were never <laughs> cowards. <laughs> and uh, it's a nice problem to have. They they uh, they mostly got along. They 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 don't speak the same language, but they speak related enough related that they can make a conversation. Mm -hmm. But um, so your your second tour. <clears throat> any change in the directive? It was still business as usual, um, going out, reconnaissance and, and patrols to yeah. intercept uh, uh, movement of the logistical stuff down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. That's where the, the mission, I would say the mission was evolving into a stronger unit versus a stronger unit coming down from the north. By the time we finished our, my second tour, uh, 1963, 64. Uh, we were getting main force Vietnamese army units coming down, fully trained, conventional military, not guerrillas. No more VC. Now you're dealing with the NVA a lot more. VC were were <clears throat> there were still some VC. I think the VC were still present in Vietnam until after the the Tet Offensive in 1968, but they they were essentially expended in the Tet Offensive. That they were given suicide missions and they were pretty well wiped out. So after 68, it was all North Vietnamese. So how you were you were in country for six months at that point uh, for your second tour, and it was I don't like. It was business as usual from the from the first tour. Any any um, serious conflicts and uh, big battles or, or uh, big skirmishes? Before? Some of the skirmishes got bigger because we were instead of encountering you know ten men with with uh, with twenty porters carrying supplies, we were we were meeting up with uh, fifty men worth 100, 150 porters. They were still, it was still the same uh, supply-oriented activities in our area, but they were getting bigger and stronger with uh, soldiers who came in from North Vietnam. When, we, did, uh, when did U.S. troops uh, get on the ground in, in yeah, Vietnam? Yeah, US, U.S. troops got on the ground in the beginning of 65. Um, so this is still the build-up to to U.S. troops being on the ground. Yeah, we were we were at uh, through my second tour, we were operating like there wasn't going to be a, a U.S. build-up. I don't know if you remember, but uh, the actual commitment of U.S. troops was based on a naval engagement. Uh, one of our ships was uh, intercepted by a patrol boat, fired at, broke contact, was intercepted again, fired at, and uh, that was the justification to put U.S. troops in the war because the North Vietnamese Navy had directly attacked U.S. Navy ships. Um, and, uh, and once we committed, it built up rather quickly. You know, we started, I think probably that 1965, we probably got uh, three or four divisions uh, probably a hundred thousand more troops into Vietnam and 66, 67, another uh, 200,000. By the time we got to the time of the Tet Offensive, which is 1968, April 6th, March of 68, um, we, had, we had walked up the U.S. presence all the way to about half a million soldiers. And special forces were a small part. Uh, we probably, out of that, uh, you know, huge half a million man force, we probably had twenty thousand, maybe thirty thousand special forces of indigenous trained. No, no, oh. of Americans. So and Ameri then the American teams, and each one of those was a force expander, or, or they had, like my team. 
in 64 had 500 mainline soldiers and at, and we're, we were still supporting some of the the village defense although we had we were going away from that strategy uh, strategy in Vietnam didn't change in big thunderbolts it, it evolved and we were going away from uh, training people to defend their own villages and going more towards training conventional units that could be moved around and the, the strike force units that we had created in those first two tours became Mike force units Mike for mobile, they were they were mobile uh, in that they could be loaded up on airplanes, flown around. In fact, even part of the of the mobile strike force became airborne qualified. They taught them how to jump and took them through jump school, and we could be inserted by parachute. So they were full time, top notch soldiers, and we got uh, through the length of the war. We had over a hundred thousand mountain yards fighting for us. So although we only had uh, 15, 20,000 American soldiers there, they were controlling 100,000. And probably, in my opinion, and I have to say this respectfully because the U.S. forces were good and they fought hard, but we probably had the most effective troops. The mountain yards were, were um, given, given an, an objective, they were sure to do what you asked them to do. They were absolutely sure. A lot died. Um, a lot died saving Americans. A lot of pilots owed their lives to uh, mountain yards who rescued them when they got shot down. Um, very, very great relationship between the mountain yards and, and uh, American troops. What, um, your, your tour, second tour ended when? My second tour ended in late 64. Our tour was over in late 64. Um, the U.S. troops got committed in early 65. I believe the Battle of Iadrang was uh, only like March or April of 65. So just a couple months after we had left. Something else interesting happened at this time. Just a historical footnote, but there was a mountain yard organization that did not swear allegiance to the Americans. They were, they were an older organization that was uh, um, fighting for independence for the mountain yards and they didn't want to be aligned with the U.S., they didn't want to be aligned with anybody. They weren't a very effective military force. They had a, they had a force but they weren't very effective. They didn't have the backing. They didn't. They didn't get a good supply of weapons, or you know, for a time the U.S. supported them. For a time the Cambodians supported them, uh, but in the end they just drifted around and was and tried to stay alive, tried to stay viable. But um, they, the, the the group, although it did accept several times in its history U.S. aid and, and operated coordinating with the U.S. was never, uh, like the rest of the mountain yards, was never completely in our fold. Anyhow, this, this, this group, the Mount, Mountain Yard uh, uh, Degas Association, um, conducted uh, a coup against the Americans. And they, they went in and talked to all the senior mountain yards and all of our special forces camps and they talked they had a tough time talking them into participating the the, the leaders who were in Cambodia of, of this mountain yard independence movement the leaders wanted them to kill the Americans and none of them would they said we'll take them prisoner and we won't kill them we won't and they and to a camp, none of them killed the Americans. One camp, only one camp, refused to join the movement, and that was Boom Brink. Ah. Boom Brink, I, I had just turned it over to my replacement, uh, Gillespie, Vern Gillespie, and uh, he had very good relations with the team, and uh, he took them through that and kept their loyalty, 100% loyalty. 
the actual the actual revolt. They they seized the radio station and the regional town. They they seized relatively un, unimportant things, but that nothing nothing happened after the initial movement where they they took over the special forces camps, and then they then they said now. What are we going to do to get back together with the Americans? <laughs> and the, the leaders of the, of the movement wanted them to go totally independent. And I said, no, we're, we're organized by the Americans. We have American weapons. We need American ammunition. We're, we're not uh, that independent. You know, we, we need to straighten out our relations with the Americans and, and, and get them out of the huts they're locked up in and back out on the field. Uh, burn. Were there any, were there, how many casualties were there and how many, were there any KIA in, in the... No Americans were killed, uh, no Americans were shot. They were, they were, they were uh, tied Just up. Detained. Detained and uh, in every camp, as I say, except the one that I've been in, in, in Boom Ring, we had, we had a special relationship in that group and, and Vern Gillespie, the guy that took over from me, was a rock solid soldier and handled it well. You can you can see this if you want to yeah, know this. anything about this. There's one edition of the National Geographic that completely covers that coup. A, a National Geographic photographer happened to be at Boonbring when uh, when this all happened. And how, how long were you gone when that happened? I was only gone about six weeks. Oh, I thought it was even less than that. I no, thought you just weeks. pulled out. Yeah, well, six weeks is a short time frame, though. Uh, and uh, my favorite company commander, a June, who I had promoted and put in that job two years before, uh, stayed totally loyal to his American counterpart. He didn't. They didn't even ask them to put their weapons away or anything. They said, "No, no, we're." We're not in revolt. We're we're here to solve the problem. And it, a, a major came down from our special forces B team, which was in play coup. I, I forget his name, but he he went with Captain Gillespie and E. June to the enemies or to the the movement's headquarters. They had set up a, a base outside Bambi to it, and. Uh, they just walked in, you know, including Vern Gillespie, <laughs> uh, wow. the American, and the major, just walked in, and they said, uh, are "You, you've done some damage to us. You, uh, you know, you, we have a joint effort trying to get freedom for the mountain yards and try, trying to uh, keep this from becoming occupied by the communists. And you've done some damage. Why did you do it?" And then they said, well, we want to be independent. We, we don't want to be dependent on anybody. I said, how many battalions do you have? And they said, we have three battalions. I said, yeah, how many battalions do the North Vietnamese have? Well, I can tell you, they have about 145 active mainstream battalions that are in South Vietnam. You have three. They have 145. You're going to uh, dominate them militarily? How do you... Are you going to make a treaty with them? I said, we'll do what we have to do. I said, you're not, your plan is not well thought out. You don't have any place to go. What are you going to do? You don't even have supplies to hang on to what you've, hung up, what you've taken. You've taken control of the special forces camps. They all need food. They're not getting enough food at those camp locations to keep them alive. They all have complex systems of supply and they have to get the supplies. You're not going to get any supplies while you're sitting on top of those camps. You're not going to get one egg. And uh, they listen and they listen. Anyhow, uh, Vern Gillespie and, and E. John were very persuasive and uh, by the end of the day they, they went on a uh, three-quarters ton truck to release the other teams that had been locked up. And by the end, of, the end of that day, the mountain yards were back in the U.S. full. That was the only time we had a 
you know, flickering of disloyalty, and it was because there was this one independent movement. Interestingly, that movement became, was a nemesis for me all the way up into uh, 2001 when I'm resettling refugees. They, that, those people who were originally from that movement didn't cooperate with me in trying to get them through uh, the United Nations Human Rights Commissioner and get them out. Um, they had a, a stupid plan of staying staying there and being persecuted. They were going to have a Gandhian type movement in Vietnam, which the Vietnamese don't don't play by the rules, you know. The mountain yards in Vietnam after the war were were killed and maimed and there was no they were, they were being held in Cambodia, right? And a UN refugee camp? Right. I mean, the, uh, what but I, this is a much later history after the war. But this is starting in, in uh, 1999. Uh, there, were, there was an uprising of the mountain yards against the Vietnamese because the Vietnamese have been stealing their land, taking their food, taking their women from the villages. So they had a little bit of an uprising. I don't think I don't think anybody was killed. I think they were demonstrations really is what, what they did. But then they the Vietnamese army sent two full divisions into the mountain yard area to arrest all of the mountain yards who had protested. And so they they ran for Cambodia. Um, they were close to the border. And in a three day march they could get across the border to a regional town. Um, they turns out that the Jurai crossed further north than the Rade. The Jurai crossed and wound up in Ratanakiri, Cambodia, and the uh, Ede and a couple of other tribes from further south, uh, Manong, uh, crossed and wound up in uh, Mondokari in, in Cambodia. Uh, anyhow, what we did to, to try to in, the, in this post-war resettlement, we, we tried to uh, get them to agree to become official refugees of the UNHCR to protect them. And, and then we set up, we actually financed refugee camps, bought supplies for them, and uh, we spent about two years gathering them and eventually lobbying for them in Washington, getting, getting them accepted as refugees. Um, the, the eventual number from that group, it went up and down. We had over a thousand for a time, and it turned out to be about 1,016 that we repatriated. A few decided to go back to their villages, just afraid of being cut off from their families, you know. Uh, and we let them go. It was not, we weren't holding them, you know. They, if they didn't want to go to the States, that was fine. But um, 1,016 did and got resettled in North Carolina. Veterans in North Carolina are still working with them today. Uh, have them on a little farm. Well, anyhow, I got to, way ahead of my third tour, but uh, but it was kind of interesting because it was the same problem, you know, the, the postscript, subtle too. subtle relationship, you know. Uh, in in uh, my in my. Uh, second, second tour, uh, we, uh, I'd say the, the peak accomplishments were heading off that, re that rebellion, uh, holding the whole force structure together, <coughs> because right about this time, with U.S. troops coming into the country, our mountain yard forces switched all to uh, 
commando units, all to mic force units. So all of the soldiers we trained continued on fighting as a mountain yard unit and as many mountain yard units. What, they, what sort of, uh, were, were the special forces all concentrated in the Central Highlands or were they dispersed no. throughout? No, there were, there were special forces in many parts of the country. Um, they were particularly effective with minorities, so they were, they were placed with the mountain yards as a minority, or in the south, Cambodians in Vietnam were a minority, and they worked with Cambodians. They worked with uh, known Chinese who were from the north, but uh, also proved to be good soldiers. Special Forces worked with just about any identifiable minority that they could spin into a military unit and get their loyalty. So, so how did your your second tour uh, culminate? What what uh, it was? You were well. Uh, was there actionable intelligence of this this uh, impending coup from the other camps nearby? Was that uh, something that there were were there signs of that before? I think left? I think the mountain yards knew about it, and and uh, the ones from Boon Bring shared it with their American counterparts, told them this was going to happen. They didn't know exactly when, but that this these people were being recruited. So they were prepared for it. They had already decided uh, how they'd handle it. They, to keep the loyalty of the mountain yards, they conducted a sacrifice. Uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, commander, Vern Gillespie, dressed in Rade clothes and and, and went through a sacrifice where he re-solidified his position with the, with the Rade. And then they, they went uh, to break up the rebellion. And they broke it up just by walking into camp and saying, no, we're not, we're not doing this. I think probably Boon Bring had the largest and best trained uh, military force of all the teams. The others had had good, you know, 300, 400, but uh, we had a minimum of 500, and they were well trained. They functioned really well. So, and, and one of the longest standing too, because you were second on the ground. That's the, exactly the right. Exactly right. From the start, yeah. We, um, well, so we counted that. I mean, it happened after technically after I left. It happened like six weeks after I left, but I counted that as. <laughs> Uh, contributing to it because I had won the loyalty of, of that group and Bernie Gillespie had converted that loyalty to him and did very well. So what are your that, feelings as you as you leave the country on, on your second tour? Yeah, well, there's always at that last moment there's always a little relaxation to get out. You're 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 under pressure every day. You're you're sleeping half asleep and half listening for uh, shots. You know. Any any trepidation now? Any like uh, reluctance to leave, or or uh, what? Um, what's going through your mind as a as a young guy in his twenties? I'm ready to I'm ready to see that airplane come to get me. And I and I was remembering uh, the uh, first tour where we practically got ambushed on the way out. So I was mindful. It was a little a little worried, I'd say, short-timers attitude, you know, same, yeah. thing, same thing. In my last week, I didn't want to get killed in my last week. <laughs> but your desire for a warm shower superseded that? <laughs> the warm shower was one of the things calling to me. <laughs> so what was your uh, trajectory after your second tour you went? Well, I went directly back to Okinawa? I went back to Okinawa, but just to, just to check out, just to turn in property for the team and right after action reports. And mom had already gone back to West Palm. Mom, mom with, had gone by John ship, Brown. yeah, back to the U.S. That's a, that's so right now you're, you're trailing the family back back to the States. Yeah, yeah. They, they had gone uh, basically five, six months before me. Oh, that much? Yeah, right. because I was going to be in Vietnam for those 
those whole six months. Right, right. So they went on to uh, to West Palm Beach, or Lake Worth, or <laughs> Palm yeah. Springs. Uh, I um, I look forward to uh, to seeing them, and you know, seeing uh, my family it was uh, it's, uh, always. Um, a strain on anybody who's got a family to be to be separated you know kids are growing up and you don't know what they're what they're doing or uh, anyhow I, but I you're gonna be stateside for about three years right? turned turned out to be about two I went from Okinawa uh, uh, direct Directly, to, I flew. I flew to West Palm Beach, and picked up your mom, and we moved to Omaha. And the Omaha assignment was to finish my my undergraduate degree. I had I had nine months of permissive leave, and the Army was going to pay my pay my uh, salary. I had to pay my school expenses out of the salary. Quick fair. And uh, I and I had to have a school accept me that could graduate me within nine months. And that's that I met all those requirements, and I graduated, and I got my got my degree in actually political science and history um, combined from University of Omaha. Uh, when we left there, we went straight to Fort Benning, Georgia. We're still. We're still hauling a U-Haul <laughs> that I had hauled from West Palm Beach out to Omaha. We're hauling it back, and uh, we got in a little, I don't know if you remember it, we got in a little traffic accident. Some Arkansas redneck cut us off, and... and uh, I wasn't, I was still in your, gleam in your eye. Oh, that's right. That's, we're moving to Fort Benning, that's where I was born. You know, I said, Eric, take care of that, take care of that. <laughs> and I thought, I thought, he, thought he took care of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm getting my my out of sequence here. Anyhow, uh, went uh, Fort Benning was was school was Fort um, Benning was in school, but it was first as an ins first as a student. I took the instructor training course, great great course. Um, and then I then I went to teach, and I I taught for about six months. Then it was my turn to be a student, so I went to the school for nine months, and then when I finished, they put me back as a teacher briefly. I, I think I had another another three or four months before they gave me orders to, for my next assignment, and uh, so I had a I had a reasonably normal life, you know, nine to five as a student or or nine to five as an instructor or, or not too. Not too bad. Not no kind of uh, twenty-four hour duty or anything. Did did language school follow Benning? Was it Fort Ord after after Lang uh, uh, language school? Followed, did that come closer to followed Benning? Uh, let me see if it was direct. Let's see. Because you didn't start work on your master's no, degree until after your it wasn't, work. It wasn't directly after. No. My, a, a, after Benning, after doing the career course and teaching there for a while, uh, I was called for an interview for a job. I went to the Pentagon and interviewed for a couple of days and I was accepted uh, to be a special security officer. And uh, just a good general description of that is the officer who handles the most uh, delicate of information in that we don't want the enemy to know that we know this or how we know it. So it, it was a special a special system to deliver our intelligence to the highest uh, ranking people in, in the Army. I worked um, uh, a year in this job and I worked at really Primarily a division headquarters, the 9th Infantry Division, and 
secondly at the MACV headquarters, the major command for all of Vietnam. Uh, I worked for uh, General O'Connor at the 9th Inf Major General O'Connor, and I worked for General Westmoreland, the four-star general. You know, and uh, that that uh, was a very educational, uh, speci especially being assigned to General Westmoreland. I, I was privy to see his back channel messages back and forth between the president and, and General Westmoreland, and they came they came to very heated conversations in that time frame because it was the debate on whether to add more troops back into Vietnam after the Tet Offensive or or just cut the scale back. cut our losses, and uh, it was very very emotional correspondence, and and I was handling it. Uh, really, you never get a you never get a chance to see, you know, strategy from the top down in in any job unless you had my job, <laughs> because right. because a planner gets to see the plans, but he doesn't get to see the conversation from the president. You know exactly. Yeah. You were you were one of two people in Vietnam at that point that had all fifty two security clearances. It was you and General Westmoreland, right? Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. I won't ask how you came to know that or anything like that. Yeah, that, that's um, interesting. You remember the 52, that's right. Uh, I remember getting a big computer printout and running down. I, I could not identify what program they corresponded to. When I looked at it, I said, I don't know what this is, I don't know what this is. So I, I inquired on a couple, you know, I just wanted to know what they were. Uh, they told me, and uh, they were things we probably wouldn't need, but if we did, we would need to have it right away. So it was a um, well thought out system. Uh, so what's it like to have your finger on the pulse? Say what's it like to have your finger on the pulse? Were you did you enjoy your first two tours on the ground, boots on the ground, or did you enjoy your third tour? The, the view from above better, or which which was more satisfying to you? The the work working with the troops on the ground more satisfying. That's what I figured. More educational, my third tour. You know, looking looking from way above how the information gets down and and some of the information that I'd never been privy to. You know, and how how good it can be and uh, it was it was very educational. Uh, I would say I had. Most, the most ideal preparatory <laughs> courses for a career, you know, I mean, I really progressed through some Nietzsche. I'd already been, um, I mean, we're talking about uh, 1964, I'm 24 years old. I've already been a company commander in the 82nd Airborne Division. I've already commanded two special forces teams, commanded a special detachment for the Assistant Chief of Staff of Intelligence of the Army. I. I had a, a pocket full of command time, good, good ratings. Always uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful. As far as career, I had a, I had a wonderful series of assignments. Can you can you talk about how you changed the uh, the way in which uh, General Westmoreland was briefed? Yeah. Or can you talk about yeah, that without yeah. getting yourself in trouble? I I think I can. <laughs> I just don't, don't want to say anything too exact, but yeah, I had a system I worked out when I was briefing General O'Connor at the 9th Infantry Division, where I would show him uh, fragmentary intelligence of uh, great import as it came in. I would show it to him the, the newest and only plot the newest, uh, emphasize on changes in his area, where units might be moving, where they might be coming from, what they might be trying to accomplish. And it was very helpful to General Connor. So I asked General Westmoreland if he'd like to, me to adopt a part of his briefing to that format, and uh, and he and he did. And it was a perfect timing because it was right before the Tet Offensive, and some of those indicators started showing from the first first briefing I gave General Westmoreland. There were troop movements. There were unusual troop movements. There were things that he might not have focused in on if I hadn't uh, held him up to the light. 
was the conventional intelligence that was um, was that also indicating that there was something going on that was uh, uh, no, large in scale? It was it was being misread. The um, the command had a bias, and I think General Westmoreland had the bias that the war was to end in a great set piece battle, where that's what happened with the French. The French uh, pushed. Uh, pushed into a, a huge perimeter in Dien Bien Phu, the valley of Dien Bien Phu, defended that position for about a year until they were overrun and they lost the war. So uh, our commanders had become convinced that they were trying to do the same thing with us. And there was a, a big, uh, the Ashal Valley was uh, heavily occupied by U.S. forces started out special forces teams, started out just two or three special forces teams up there. Then they were reinforced with a couple of marine battalions and then the enemy started bringing more and more troops. Then they were reinforced by more army troops and it became the most fortified area of the country. So what General Westmoreland honestly thought was he was going to have this big uh, no, tremendous no, battle no. in the Ashal Valley and uh, we were going to need tons and tons and tons of munitions for B-52. If you don't mind my backing up, I'm showing my ignorance here, but what was the intent of the Tet Offense so from, from the perspective of the North Vietnamese? Were they intending to, because they took all these cities and immediately lost them, what was the intent? They was thought it? they were going to have a popular uprising and, and hang on to everything. They thought this was going to end the war. And, it, and there was no popular uprising anywhere. But their act, their actions were very brutal. They, they, they didn't go about it wisely if they're looking for a popular uprising. Because the first thing they did, they went in and, and killed anybody who had been in government. They, school teacher, nurse, doctor, anybody who was serving the public got killed. And so they alienated them, themselves from the people who were more neutral or not, not too involved. And, um, and they, were, they were particularly brutal in the cities that they managed to stay in for some time, like, like Wei. So, so they, did, they didn't win any hearts and minds, all they did was cause a big military pushback. Yeah. And they were, they were outgunned. Well, they lost uh, every position they took, they lost over a month. You know, some they held for a day, some they held for two days. Saigon, they were in two or three days. They actually occupied the U.S. Embassy, uh, which had been evacuated. But um, they, they were pushed out of everything within a month. You know, the slowest ones to come back were the, the ones that were attacked with the highest level of firepower. The Marines had to fight two divisions, uh, about 20,000 North Vietnamese main force uh, forces that occupied the city of Way. Way was the old imperial capital, and it had uh, it was inner. Uh, the whole city was a series of fortifications from medieval times, but uh, tunnels and fortifications. But it was uh, it served for the, uh, uh, the, the North Vietnamese to entrench themselves when they took it. And, they, and it took a month, and it took a lot, of, a lot of deaths for the Marines to drive them out of there. So we're, you're, you're sort of providing this uh, overview with uh, actionable intelligence. Did it get utilized at all, or was it just, uh, um, you know, was fallen by the wayside. Uh, I think it, it depended on the person, you know. I, I don't think that General Westmoreland made the use of it that he should have. I think one of his subordinates, General Wyand, three-star general, he moved without orders from Westmoreland, he moved his forces and, because he saw it coming. He, he could tell not only when it was going to happen, but what was going to happen. He could see the movement of the, of the troops. 
uh, and he he had U.S. troops move to block the entrances to the city to keep reinforcements from getting into the city after the initial attack. Uh, he was, in my mind, he was the hero of the Tet Offensive, and he never got credit. I mean, most people don't even know what his role was, but uh, he, uh, by taking, he didn't. And he didn't even, he just told General Westmoreland what he was doing. He didn't uh, request permission. He didn't say, that this fits your plan. He said, I'm moving 9th Division over here. I'm moving the 25th Division over here. And I just let them know what, where they were going to be. And uh, Westmoreland was a kind of a, as I say, a weak commander. And he was happy with that. He, you know. I was going to be Fred Wyant's fault if it didn't work, you know, not, not his. <laughs> so, uh, anyhow, as a military uh, battle, it, it was unsuccessful for the Vietnamese. They, they planned it to be a, one big punch to take over the country and the war was over. They, they thought this was it. Well, it, it not only didn't worked that way, there was no uh, no rapid victory, but they had like 55% casualties. More than half of the North Vietnamese forces were destroyed and they had to rebuild, they had to, it took two years to rebuild their force. They had to rotate units back to North Vietnam, re-equip them, send new trainees, so militarily, it was purely militarily, without considering the civilian ramification, it was uh, a victory for the U.S. However, it had become a political issue. The, uh, the left wing in the United States was arguing against the war, war and it was becoming more emotional all the time. Like, a little like the left-right split we have now, uh, same people. Uh, General uh, Westmoreland was always, everything he said publicly was a little too optimistic. He said, you know, I see we've turned the corner. I can tell you that we've never had a better army in the field than we've got in Vietnam. And uh, two weeks later, his forces have been knocked out of every provincial capital, every, every main city. How, how long after that was his exit in General Abrams' entrance? Uh, very soon. I can't, I can't tell you exactly. Abrams, Abrams came in as deputy commander, which was his introduction time. I left while Abrams was uh, being groomed for the deputy position. commander officially, and Westmoreland left shortly after I did. I don't, I don't know. I have to look it up at the press to see when he left. But um, so, any any different feelings about leaving your third tour versus your first or second? Was, um, uh, yeah, I uh, the whole for me the whole tone of the war changed because I was very cognizant of. The, the public opinion effect on the war. That, that the liberals and conservatives were splitting horribly about whether to just abandon the war or, or what. And, uh, and when Westmoreland had been rosy about the outlook, you know, we're turning the corner, we're, we're just a year or two from winning this whole thing now, uh, and then to have every major governmental position in the country overrun, at least for a day. Lyndon Johnson could have uh, sent another 100,000 troops, but he would have been, it would have been uh, asked to resign. Uh, he didn't seek office again. Yeah. You'd have, you'd have thought yeah, he would have just put enough in there to win the war decisively and be done with it. It was a, uh, it was by any matrix, other than political, the the U.S. won the war right up to the moment that they abandoned Saigon. 
Yes. No? Yes. And um, we were fighting already with one arm behind our back. For example, we couldn't attack uh, North Vietnamese units in North Vietnam. We couldn't attack them when they came into the South. But we couldn't attack them in, in North Vietnam. Um, the the great fear was that we'd hit Chinese units, and Chinese anti-aircraft guns came down into North Vietnam and set up in North Vietnam. So we had to fly over Chinese anti-aircraft guns that were shooting at us without being able to shoot back. A lot, a lot of this stuff just was ridiculous, you know. If you're going to have a war, you need to have a war. You need to win it. Yeah. yeah, and you have to go to win it, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm more in favor of uh, think longer and harder about if you want to get into this war. And if you want to get into it, then by God, take with you the winning solution, you know, to get out of it as a winner. So, so what follows your third tour of Vietnam? You're, you head back and um, I'm yeah. imagining language school was in there somewhere. Yeah, well, um, yeah. And I know you went, got your master's at University of Florida. Wow. And then you were off into intelligence, but am I skipping over anything? Uh, well, it was one interesting footnote to me coming back. I flew just on my flight back. I got a, uh, you could go, you could program your flights for a civilian airline. You know, you could fly the nice comfortable airline, or you could fly, if you could find a, an Air Force plane that was going, you could fly in the back. I, ha I found out long ago the most comfortable flying is to take your air mattress and, and your poncho liner and get in the back, crawl up on top of a pallet of cargo and spread out and sleep your way. <laughs> so I, I got to go on uh, a C-141 cargo plane which was flying back to Dover, Delaware. And uh, the interesting thing the day I arrived back, which I believe, I have to look at the newspapers for confirmation of the date. I believe it was April 6th, but happened to be an inauspicious day to arrive in Dover, Delaware. Um, Martin Luther King had been shot the morning of that day, uh -huh. and the whole country was up in flames, and I mean literally up in flames, taking a van from Dover, Delaware, back up to D.C., the van had to go around 10, 15 different cities because they were, it looked like Vietnam. And that man, wow. everything was burning. It was just a hell of a welcome home, you know. I had to catch a flight out of Washington the next morning. I got there, there was no no problem from there on, but getting from, from uh, the Air Force Base back to Washington was a, a real experience. So I flew home, got reunited with my family, and uh, had a couple of weeks vacation, which was nice. We, we just uh, hung around, visited. Uh, what was next militarily, in your military career, what came next? Yeah, let's see, this was... Okay, this was 67, 68. I went, I went from there to California to go language to school. language school, uh, to take Spanish. I had been accepted for the Foreign Area Specialist Program. So uh, I had to do a graduate course in Latin American Studies, and I had to do the language course in Spanish. Language course was six months at Presidio Monterey. So we went out, we got a nice house at Fort Ord, um, pretty pretty little house and well located, and I had a wonderful language class. The Army Language School is just tip top in teaching language. They, the classes are no more than ten, or no less than ten. They're ten ten people, and um, you spend more time talking and listening than you do reading, you don't learn grammar in the book, you learn talk and response, talk and response, and then you get some grammar to put in under it towards the end of the course. 
It's a very effective method. I learned a good base for Spanish there. And then we, uh, when we finished that, we went right off to another academic setting. I went to the University of Florida, uh, where I was going to do my graduate program. I had uh, a year and a half to finish my graduate program. Most graduate programs are, are two years, and there was no, no special program for the Army here. I had to do the full MA uh, in Latin American Studies. But it, I found it very interesting, and uh, I, I loved it. I, I enjoyed being a student. What was your thesis on? Pardon? You, you wrote a thesis on that? I wrote a thesis on the Cuban Army, yeah. Uh, a history of the Cuban Army from 1933 to 59. Those happened to be mm, bookend years for the dictator Batista. He took over the sergeant's revolt in 1933, ruled all the way up to 1950, and then they had two sets of elections, two open elections, which were very chaotic in Cuba, and then Batista seized the government again in uh, 1953, and he ruled until Castro took it away from him in 59. How, how long was the how, what time elapsed between you finishing your master's and your work at the Pentagon? Well, uh, there was a big block in there, which is the time I spent in Mexico. Uh, oh, yeah. When I, when I finished, um, I'd been accepted for the specialist program, and the specialist program was going to station me in Mexico for a year and a half, of travel and study, but I found I I found out about a job teaching in Mexico, uh, in which it would be a three-year assignment. So I went. I asked if I qualified. It was uh, as a member of the West Point faculty, but as an exchange instructor teaching English in Mexico. And one Mexican officer went to West Point. And yes, I, I got that, and I even got it uh, a blend of the two programs because the school was only going to be uh, nine months a year. Those three summer months were mine free to travel. That was the, that was the travel phase. What I did, I, got, uh, I bought a camper and loaded up the camper and, and traveled in that. The, uh, um, the, the Army paid me per diem, which is allowance per day for, for water and food and uh, groceries or whatever, and, and I had the time, active duty time, fully paid. Um, it was a wonderful experience. Traveled to every, every state and every territory in Mexico and from the furthest back little, little backwaters to the biggest cities. Knocking out power in the Yucatan Peninsula or wherever it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that happened mainly in Central America. We, the third year we went all the way down to, drove the camper all the way down to Panama, Panama Canal. And, uh, and we had to find places to park. There were no no trailer parks much once we got down into Central America. Or a few, but not much. So I would I would look up uh, a gas station in a little town and say, uh, can I uh, plug into your electric for the night? And I'll pay you, you know. And they would come up with some figure that they thought was high, but I knew better. <laughs> I said, I'll pay it, I'll pay it. <laughs> then they'd look in the morning <laughs> One morning we got up and all the ice cream in the town had melted. <laughs> <laughs> Knocked out the power of the whole town. Yeah. Uh, was that in Panama? No, that was in, on the road down. I think it was Guatemala. Guatemala? Yeah. <laughs> we, had a, we had a super good travel experience. Got to, got to visit everything that was interesting. We could, I could go to a factory and my 
my entree as an active duty army officer, you know, on official travel, would get me in. I could go go see how they did their manufacturing process or whatever, or I could go to tourist locations and probably get a, a little better view than the average tourist. Uh, so you were technically a professor at West Point with an exchange program through the Mexican War College? Yes. Mm. And that was my status for three years. Was there any other uh, ancillary stuff you did with the embassy? Was it... Uh, um, uh, yeah, was I, it was a, I was not a... I was... My, my job description didn't say spy, <laughs> but I was the only... American serving with Mexican forces. There were other Americans who were there as attachés, but they didn't serve with. And I, being at the school and serving with these guys. So you'd naturally report anything that was of interest or, or that yeah, would be yeah, yeah. actionable. Report everything of interest. Somehow, at the very end, they, they got wind of what I was doing. <laughs> it got just the last month or so I was there, it got tricky. I can't come to your house, Carlos, but uh, we can get together at a restaurant. Okay, let's go to a restaurant. <laughs> so uh, then Mexico, we moved from Mexico back to Mexico, was Gainesville next, right? From, from Mexico, we went to my military schooling, Command and General Staff College. Where? And Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Oh, Fort Leavenworth. Oh, okay. And we have was a year course. This is like seventy-two now, nineteen seventy-two-ish. Yeah, 70, 72, 74. 74. No. We we were. It's not Bowie, Maryland yet. Seventy-four was. Oh uh, uh, yeah. Seventy-four, seventy-five. You're right. Yeah, it was a uh, right. Bowie. Bowie was next. It was uh, uh, Fort Leavenworth. I was in second grade. I was in third, fourth, and fifth grade in Bowie, Maryland. So. You're right. Which, what was the school in Fort Leavenworth? Uh, the Command and General Staff College. Which is... Uh, for senior officers. Uh, grooming you for... You're, you've been a major the whole time that I can recall in the, in the Army. And at the end you were... Um, Lieutenant Colonel. Bumped up to Lieutenant Colonel. But that would come in another three years. That would be after Maryland. That would be uh, when we were at Fort Bragg. When I was in no, sixth grade. I got promoted to lieutenant colonel in the Pentagon. Oh, did you? Oh. Yeah, I remember the ceremony. Yeah, I so, got promoted towards the end of my tour in the Pentagon. How did you come by the position in the Pentagon in Latin American studies? Well, I I had been trained. For that was a, the, all. Your your masters was. Uh, was geared directly toward this position and no it was it was a generalist latin americanist uh background M my job was specific it it and my area happened to include mexico central america and canada that was the area of the world i was responsible for uh, so how did you come to be uh thought of as a good friend to manuel noriega <laughs> <laughs> that's that's interesting I, I told you I had worked for the uh, assistant chief of staff for intelligence one year when I was in in that detachment in Vietnam. My name had a good reputation there. You know, I had I had done a really good job. Got lots of thank you letters and attaboys and everything. So um, Je the the what was his name? The assistant chief of staff for intelligence. Can't I see him? But I can't think of his name. Anyhow, he he asked me by name. He went to uh, Wally Nutting, my boss, two-star general, and he said, uh, "You got a young man there, speaks pretty good Spanish, and and I know him from previous assignments, and I really like the way he works. I wonder if I could borrow him for two weeks." And he said, "Well, let me see what he's." what he's working on. <laughs> so I rolled out my list. I had it. I said, these are, these are the 21 things he's working on. Is your thing more important than any of these 21? <laughs> than all of these 21? <laughs> and he said, 
I, I can't make that assessment, General. You got to tell me if you can spare him or not. I said, I, what I want him for, uh, the number two guy in Panama, um, Manuel Noriega, is coming up here, and I need an escort, and I need someone who could be, you know, maybe catch something on the fly, or, you know, talk with him, and you know, we're coming up on the Panama Canal treaty negotiations. That was going to be my section too. It, Right. Staff responsibility was going to be in desk ops. So I said, "Yeah, I have uh, a general. We're going to be we're going to be on that in our office at SSM." I said, "We're starting to work up books of questions and things on stances." Uh, he said, "Well, it sounds to me like these these this fits pretty well with what you're doing." I said, "I'm not going to get you too far behind here, no." I said, "No, sir. I'll I'll make everything work." So he, he, uh, they called me in for one day's orientation. Uh, wasn't it only, really only half a day. Just the type of questions they'd like to ask and, and general instructions about not, not being too specific so that it puts them on a lawyer. You know, I kind of knew, knew everything they were telling me. And uh, so then my job, when he came, I flew down to Miami and I had to meet them here. They were coming up from Panama. So I had a, unfortunately the, the transportation schedule was kind of bad. They came in at uh, like 10 in the morning and we didn't have a flight out until 5 in the afternoon. So I looked for something we could do. Uh, so I, I thought maybe, well hell, I'll take them, I'll take them to, <laughs> uh, Sea World. <laughs> so they were they were a rough speak group, and uh, after I got in, we started talking. You know, we, we were. Uh, I, I never heard this before. I, I never. Yeah, heard no, I, yeah. I I made myself friends with them and using curse words for every other word, like they were like, you know, and uh, and so we would go over to. Is it Sea World? I think uh, yeah. Sea World. You were you were you were his his uh, personal liaison, his guide, uh, his uh, assistant, uh, right. yeah, ranging, and, ranging and just kind visits. of keeping your eyes and ears open, but not not uh, revealing anything. Yeah, and so reporting back. We got in the first. I think it was the the Seal Act. Was it? The seals are jumping in. <laughs> and he says, Carlos. <laughs> so what are, surely there's something to do in Miami other than this. <laughs> I said, it's all here waiting for you, my colonel. He meant that in the best possible way. <laughs> so uh, start start with uh, uh, your your uh, now his assigned personally is on to Manuel Noriega and you have to pick him up in Miami? Yeah, pick him up in Miami and take him take him on his U.S. Army sponsored tour. Uh, I didn't know it at that point, but I was also going to get invited to continue on his, on Noriega's private tour, which continued after. But I didn't know that at the time. I, I, I rack it up to uh, Good impressions. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, I I picked him up at the airport, and I had to I had like a six-hour time gap or seven-hour time gap. I had to fill it, so I had to think of something that I couldn't get criticized for. And I thought cultural activity. I'll take him to I'll take him to uh, Marine World or Sea World. Yeah. Sea World. And so uh, <laughs> I bought the tickets and everything, and I had it all set. I sat him down, and they started a, a seal show. All the little seals passing the ball back and forth. And he, and he looks at me and says, Carlos, isn't there something better to do in Miami? I said, it's all out there waiting for you, Colonel. Just give me a hint. He said, is there a Playboy Club? Yes, and I know where it is. <laughs> so we went to the Playboy Club, and they killed the time until the afternoon flight up at the Playboy Club. <laughs> and uh, I kind of started the relationship 
good because we were, you know, I was I was working to make the trip work for him, you know. Uh, some of the days were pretty boring the way they had them programmed. But, uh, so we went to Washington. We stayed in the Watergate Hotel. Uh, was there any... Um was there an agenda on his part that did he wanted to see something happen about the Panama Canal Treaty when he got to D.C.? Or was it really just a, a it, meet and greet? It was, and established it was a relationship. meet and greet money that the Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence had to spark anybody in the world who he wanted to develop a relationship with. So he invited Noriega, who appeared to everybody as the guy who was going to follow Torrijos in office. Uh, How long was it before Noriega rose to power after after this? As soon as he killed Torrijos. Yeah, when, when was this? About uh, four years later. So they close to the 80s, bombed, late yeah, 70s? Bombed, bombed his plane. Bombed his plane and, and Noriega took over. Yeah. Uh, Your impressions of Noriega as a, as a person? Scumbag. Yeah. Total, Street dog. Total scumbag. Yeah. Oh, how did he filter up into the the army like they're all being a strong arm? They're all thugs. They're, 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 their national guard was thuggery in uniform. You know, oh, this is a, an aside, not part of this story. But when I I was running the conference of American armies in Uruguay, and every country sends a delegation, they uh, express expressed their their disfavor with the Uruguayan food by dumping their trays on the table you know, in the officer's mess. That's just thugs. Just thugs. Yeah. Anyhow, I uh, I had a good a good trip with him. It, 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 it's a long story if I tell you the whole thing, but he basically from Washington we had a very interesting side story. We were staying in the Watergate Hotel. In the Watergate Hotel, there was a Ford dealership uh, on the ground floor. So he says, uh, I want to go down and look at cars. So we go, and, and his brother-in-law, who was along on the trip, grabs a big suitcase. I said, we're, we're not going to be moving. He said, no, no, I need this. And so I lugged the big suitcase down to the car dealership. I hadn't figured out what it was for yet. We got in there, and then he says, "He says, here's what I need." He said, first of all, you got a black salesman?" And they said, "No, we don't. We don't have one on duty today." He said, "That's a shame. I had an order for 12 cars, but only for a black salesman." Wait right here. Wait, wait right here, Colonel. I'll see what I can find. And they roll in a, a new guy, you know. And he says, "Yes, uh, Colonel Anderson, you want to buy cars?" He said, Yes, I do. I want four LTDs, black, solid black, uh, and I want them sent to the Cologne Free Zone. I want it's it's a zone in Panama. Maybe it's a, a, a treaty zone. He says, okay, I want uh, I don't want four of this, and I want four of this, and four of this. He, had, he bought twelve cars. And um, he d did not ask for a discount. He asked the salesman, are they going to cheat you out of your commission because I'm buying so many? He said, I'm going to have to share it. He said, no, you're not. And he called the manager, sales manager back in. He says, I want you to calculate for me the commission that this man is going to earn if he gets all the cars that I want the way I want them. And the sales manager went back. And, Calculated something in balance, you know. So he, he said, "This is this is it." I uh, said, "Did you want to take from that commission to cut your price?" He said, "No, I just wanted to make sure he gets paid." You put your signature on this. If that's what he's going to get. And he signed it. So the black guy's loving him. <laughs> he says, "Now, what uh, was that? What was that about?" He just uh, he, he he knew that it was the one black guy in the whole organization. They weren't going to let him keep sixty, eighty thousand dollars worth of commission, you know. So he was, he was trying to lock it in for him. That's what all it was. A uh, just chaos, mas macho, and throwing his weight around, yeah, pushing people around. And then it was his turn to push the black guy around. 
He says, now, I got those 12 cars, I want a 13th. Now I want, I want an LTD, but I want the grill pulled out, and I want the grill, you know the, the car that was in the movie, um, I want that one for me. This is a James Bond oh, movie? With I had the title, no, not James Bond, it was a black, Shaft. Oh. Shaft. He said, said, I want the grill like the car had in Shaft. And so he says, let me, let me check on that. And he goes, it's, they're telling me it's not an option. Oh, that's a shame, because I'm going to cancel the whole fucking order. <laughs> <laughs> he says, so wait for me, please, please. Car. Goes back out. The sales manager says, yeah, we can, we can take it over to a <laughs> charge him $3,000 extra for the grill, because we're going to have to have it made. And he goes back and he says, that, that grill treatment's going to cost $3,000, but the very best, the very best. <laughs> so Noriega says, okay. And went through a couple other little dickerings and, and finally, uh, the guy says, um, uh, the salesman says, are you going to want financing? No. Are you going to want to pay by bank draft? No. How are you going to pay, sir? <laughs> he said, Carlos, Whitby, his, his cousin, Carlos, bring the money. <laughs> oh, crack them, that's okay. Carlos was the auditor of national casinos in Panama. <laughs> and his brother-in-law. Noriega's brother-in-law. <laughs> so Carlos starts counting out 80, 90, 100, 120, 140, 100, you know, whatever, whatever it came to, and the whole thing in cash. And he says, now how long till I get my car with the, with the grill? And he says, uh, let me call. And the sales manager now is, is mothering the whole deal, you know, sure. he says, you don't even have to call. I'm going to tell him he's got to get it done in two weeks. <laughs> so tell him we're ready to ship in two weeks, Whatever, then whatever it takes to get to Panama. And so the, the general agrees. And the uh, kid walked out of there with the, the day in a salesman's life. And uh, Noriega, we, we traced the cars later through intelligence. The four LTDs that went to the... Uh, the duty-free zone at the east end of the canal went to Fidel Castro as his personal fleet of limos. And another another one went overseas too, I forget which one. I think I think the shaft car was for Norway. <laughs> That's funny. He <clears throat> so after his DC rounds, he goes to San Diego, no? No, and then to Vegas? no, we worked our way west. Um, let me see. We went from there on a quick trip to Conark, Continental Army Command in Virginia. And we, uh, our, our tour there was uh, half a day. And uh, then we were going to Fort Bragg. He says, he says, why don't we go to Fort Bragg today and, and not stay here? I said, sure. Well, this thing had been coordinated and the room was set up for tomorrow. And uh, I, You know, I had a guy working for me who was senior to me. My project officer at Fort Bragg was Colonel Charlie Beckwith. He was my, my senior, but uh, he, was, he, was, he was my fetch it this day. I called him and said, uh, I said Colonel, I can't. Can't talk much, but uh, uh, the colonel has just changed his itinerary. We're, he wants to arrive at Fort Bragg this evening. Uh, I think I'm looking at the flights. I think the earliest we can get there is like 6:30. I said, "Can you get him billeted uh, for the night? Hopefully, in the same same facility we were talking about before for 6:30 tonight." He says, "Shit, fire! Does he want to go over and see the general tonight?" I said, "No, he didn't say that." Well, why don't we why don't we leave the visit for with the general for tomorrow? Just get him into Fort Bragg and and I'll handle him when he gets here. He says, "Shit, fire, Regan, you, you, you fucking with me? <laughs> no, no, Colonel, I'm not." <laughs> so, I said, "We're on our way." <laughs> 
So we got there. They they had changed the the reservation. A room had been somewhat decorated and upgraded for them. It was in a in a BOQ, but it but it had been they taken standard furniture out and brought in upgraded furniture and everything. And when he got there, he said, I said, uh, Colonel, I don't know if you're tired or if you want to go out or you want to, shit, let's, what's to do here? I said, well, I looked up what was, what was going on in Fayetteville and, and Jerry Lee Lewis was playing. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, "Yeah, I'd like that." <laughs> so I took him to the Jerry Lee Lewis Ultimate Round, uh, and he he enjoyed it. He, uh, about he got mad at me. I, I, halfway through, he said, uh, "Can you introduce me to a young woman around here?" I said, "That's not my specialty, but..." Let me let me see if I can find somebody who'd like to talk to a very distinguished Panamanian. So I, I went out and I found a, a girl from Panama, pretty young. And he says, "You bringing me a Panamanian? I live with Panamanians. I I, I eat Panamanians for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner. So don't bring me, don't bring me a Panamanian." So I go back and I found these two exhibitionist looking white girls, you know, they were in skanky clothes with side boobs showing and you know, I said, uh, I'm here escorting a very important foreign officer. Would you like to do something patriotic for your country <laughs> and, and have a few drinks with him, accompany him? Uh, the, the one I'm not talking to, the skankier of the two, says, does he want to fuck? <laughs> I, I said, I don't really know, but he might. He said, that'll cost him. I said, well, that's between you and him. <laughs> so I, so I uh, brought the, least, the less skanky one over, and, uh, and he starts talking to her, and he says, uh, how many girls can you round up? I got six guys with me. I'd like to get them all a girl. She said, oh yeah, I, I, I get six girls real quick. <laughs> so, after Jerry Lee Lewis did his final <laughs> routine, off they went. I said, I said now Colonel, I'm, your address at the BOQ is written down on this card, and uh, right. your, the key is with the charge of quarters. You go to the opening to the BOQ and the charge of quarters will be sitting inside on the right, just tell him that you're Colonel Noriega and we've made arrangements for you to pick up the keys there. I said, uh, with your permission, I'm going home. <laughs> he said, yeah, go ahead, get on out of here. <laughs> and uh, that worked out. Uh, the next day, what the hell do we do? Fort Bragg. When we went, we called on a couple of generals I think we went to a, a small airborne demonstration. There were like a battalion was jumping or something, you know, with 800, 900 people or something like that. It wasn't a big show, but it was a, a real tactical jump. <clears throat> jump. And uh, he liked that. He said, Was this a Bradley drop zone? Yeah. Was it? Yeah. He said, uh, We don't get to see. He said, We get occasionally, we get U.S. troops come into the canal zone and drop in. I said, yes, I've done that, <laughs> Colonel, I know. I know what the view is coming in off uh, the Pacific. <laughs> and he said, you don't want to fall out early. I said, no, we had a, a jump master in my unit who fell out and got eaten by the sharks. Really? He said, yeah, that happens a lot. I said, you don't want to fall in the Pacific side. Uh, anyhow. Went through that, and then we then we moved on, and from there, we had a uh, don't know why we went to Dallas Fort Worth. Can't think of what we were visiting, but we went to Dallas Fort Worth, had a visit, and uh, 
oh, the phone conversation. I'm, I've been drinking with him now every day. They, they, he drinks. I couldn't imagine that he stayed alive with what he was drinking. You know, he drinks all day long. So I'm drinking with him, and uh, he gets on the telephone. I'm sure I've told you this one. He, I know. He, I'm only hearing his side of the conversation. I don't hear the other. He says, uh, "Yeah." I said, "Do we know if he's got any family that count?" Do we know if he has anybody who served in government or the National Guard? Okay, kill him. Huh? Like that. that. That made headlines in my report. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> then we couldn't figure out who it was, but uh, there was there was a death that week. That we suspected was uh, he was, uh, was an he? activist, you know, an activist oh. against the military regime. Uh, that was the big event for there. <clears throat> then we moved on to uh, Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Fort Huachuca was at that time it's a communications base, but at that time it was also where they were testing radars, troop radar, you know, for the front lines. And uh, so they took him out and they gave him a confidential briefing. Um, everything was classified, the equipment was classified. I was surprised they gave it to him. Seven, eight days after I picked him up, he says, Regan, we're going to Las Vegas. And I believe the, the Chinese have got a whole floor reserved for me. Would you like to come along? I said, yes, sir, that sounds, that sounds like fun. <laughs> Wanted to know what the fuck he was going to do with the Chinese. <laughs> when we got there, he had two floors <clears throat> and two separate hotels <clears throat> reserved. The, the Stardust? Las, Las Vegas Hotel Owners Association, parentheses Mafia, had a whole floor in... Stardust? I forget which one. You could brought back matchbooks from the Stardust. I remember that. Maybe it was Stardust. John and Brian were collecting matchbooks at the time. Yeah, probably I remember was. purple matchbook. With yeah, them. yeah. And uh, <clears throat> and the Chinese embassy uh, was a was called the Chinese interest section because we hadn't renewed total diplomatic relations. The Chinese interest section all in their Mao jackets and with their red books. This was the middle of the Mao years, you know. Wow. They were standing down there, greeting him, waving their red books. <laughs> and and uh, so I, I said, uh, Colonel, you're right. You have, you have two complete hotels reserved for you. He says, yeah, and I have a plan. I said, what are we, what are we gonna do, sir? He says, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna send the ladies with the cheap with the chinos, <laughs> and we're going to the other one. <laughs> so the mafia is more fun. <laughs> so the ladies were screaming and yelling, you know, <laughs> put, them, put them on their bus for the, They went to the, the tropical, and uh, he was, uh, he was a character. So we got there. <clears throat> I was embarrassed because I'm still in a uniform. We've been in an army base, you know. I'm, I'm in a short sleeve khaki uniform. I don't want to be seen with this guy. Never mind. So they say, would you like us to hold the magic show? It's supposed to start right now, but we'll hold it while you freshen up a little. And he said, yeah, hold the magic show. He said, and he put his head in. And he said, which are my seats? He said, this table, which is almost the exact center table, he said, get me the exact center table, please. <laughs> and he walked away to clean up. Give me you know who was at the exact center table? The governor of Texas, a woman. Ann Richards? Yeah. She had a hissy fit. She said, she said, I invited my family here. I set this up ahead of time. And, and he looked at her, he said, foreign diplomat. I, I my hands are tied, it's a foreign diplomat. And then I show up, 
wearing a uniform. And I said, I, I gotta have time to change. I gotta get in civilian clothes. And they said, no, we're holding the show. We already got a theater full of people waiting 30 minutes for the show. I said, you can't wait for you too. <laughs> I said, okay. So they dribbled back in. The show started. The governor turned around and looked at us and looked at us. She, she looked at me and said, what's your name? I said, Corporal Tillman. <laughs> I knew there was a, little, a nasty letter coming out of that. <laughs> she was there with her grandchildren, you know. Oh, gosh. Anyhow. So, uh, I got back up to my room, and there's a little... I opened the door. There's two, not one, but two. I said, the Colonel wants us to make you happy. I said, come on in. <laughs> I said, now the sad truth is that I'm a married man and I'm I'm a loyal married man. I was at that point, <laughs> a good man. And I said, I don't want him to know that I didn't take his his offer. And so I would like you to go tell him that I'm one sexy guy, <laughs> and, and that it took two of you, <laughs> took two of you to rope me down. <laughs> and, and if you can do that, this is a hundred dollar tip for you, and this is a hundred dollar tip for you. She said, "You don't want no blowjob." I said, "Not even." <laughs> I just, I just want great reports to go back. That on my second blowjob, I said, "Thank you, Colonel Norgate." <laughs> <laughs> they laughed. They said, it's all living. <laughs> so they stayed with me. We, we watched TV for, I made them a drink. We watched TV for about, I don't know, 45 minutes. Decent enough time that I said, make sure he knows I really had a good time. And, and, and you are sweet ladies. I, I said, I wish I was under different circumstances as to my marital status. <laughs> so what... The, did the trip in there with him? Uh, yeah, the trip ended at the end of the Las Vegas part, but that went on for four days. Holy smoke, man! Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was he was meeting with the mafia, and then he was, uh, you know, meeting with the Chinese. And mm -hmm. The Chinese wanted to see him because they were they were anticipating going into casino, casinos. And they, they knew that he had started up, gone from tiny little casino operations to, to big casino operations in the last year. Um, but that, uh, that trip was packed with events. Uh, that's uh, funny. I didn't know half of that stuff. I, I, I always yeah, thought it was just... I think I've been reluctant to tell, tell all of that because at one time it was classified, you know. I thought it was D.C., San Diego, and Las Vegas for whatever reason. No, I don't know why I had San didn't Diego. Didn't go to California, no. Didn't go to California. So well, your, your chief my, focus wasn't the Panama Canal Treaty. It was a number it of It was things. one of the things we were preparing for. We actually had, we actually had a team of uh, three people handling Latin America. Uh, you've heard me talk about Ward Smith. He's, well, I know Ward Smith. Yeah, you know Ward Smith. They, Great guy. He was one of the team. Uh, uh, Chuck, uh, what was Chuck's last name? Oh, having memory problems. Chuck Westphaling was the other member. Uh, both of them were West Point officers, really top notch. And we, we worked, the three of us worked together for everything Latin America. Uh, we'd have to uh, very often write up uh, a summary for the chief of staff or if there were some Latin American dignitary visiting we'd have to write up you know who he was and and what the chief of staff should know about him when he meets him that kind of thing so there was a constant flow of work we were new jobs every day we also were three conscientious guys that actually generated new work we actually sat down, looked at our RRA responsibility and said, what should we be doing? You know, what, what are we not doing as the U.S. Army that we should be doing? 
one initiative that we started on and carried through was to relocate the School of the Americas. The School of the Americas is a, a, a U.S. Army school set up to train Latin Americans and we were doing it all in Panama. Now we're looking at the Panama Canal Treaty being negotiated and we're looking at the need to move that at some point. So we were trying, the, the big discussion was are we better in another Latin American country? Are we better taking it into the U.S., you know, having, having it at Fort Benning, Georgia? Um, and Is that's, that debate went on past our time, but we initiated <clears throat> the, the discussion on what it should be. Was this during the Carter administration, or was this still Nixon? Or? Uh, the Carter administration was, we were, we were, the three of us were there when the Carter administration started. Um, you were there for Nixon, Ford, and Carter, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I didn't, I don't think I overlapped uh, the Nixon. I, I overlapped uh, Ford, but I don't think I overlapped Nixon. I, I think, we, were, uh, we were living in Bowie when Nixon resigned. Were we? I was, I was thinking that was when we were leaving Mexico. <clears throat> Definitely. Okay. Okay. Definitely, Maryland. So he had he had this way. I I didn't remember. I do remember uh, dealing with the Carter transition team. They were they were surprisingly hostile to anybody in the military. Uh, it surprised me that they would be that hostile. I mean, it was like they felt like uh, the military had cheated them, lied to them. I don't I don't. I never understood all the causes, but I know that they started out on a very bad foot with, with the military. Um, couldn't, couldn't really decide uh, why, but they had, I think in their the start of the, uh, the left wing branch of the Democratic Party, which they, they were definitely, I think they started distrusting. Uh, U.S. institutions and uh, was was not good. Uh, I always thought of Jimmy Carter as a you know a very conscientious guy, but uh, I'm not I'm not sure that he was uh, even-handed with the military. He found reasons to uh, disapprove. So what um, what happened with the School of the Americas? What uh, eventually happened? Right. Uh, okay, in, in the end, uh, the, the School of the Americas was uh, moved up to uh, U.S. bases, U.S. soil, operated in the U.S. Um, it was, was it your it was, position? It was politically um, questionable because well, it was often written up, you know, you, you take the, the top people from Latin America over a 15, 20 year period, the top military people, they're involved, many, in politics, they're involved in corruption. Uh, Latin America is not as pure as the driven snow, and so when you deal with the military, you take the mix as they are, uh, and people would attribute a uh, cause to them being trained by the U.S., uh, whereas really any U.S. training was trying to steer away from corruption and towards uh, doing things the right way, but but the critics lumped them together as, you know, having learned uh, how, to, how to steal from their governments from U.S. schools, which is absolutely untrue. Hmm? Well, those were uh, those were some of the issues, but issues came up every day. You know, a, a soldier crosses the border without showing his passport. He gets arrested in Mexico, and he's an active duty soldier. <clears throat> it's a problem that's got to be worked out. And uh, the State Department 
does part of it, but because he's military, uh, the it has other implications. Go down there and and work on it. Yeah, uh, there. It's a, a ton of little jobs that just keep it keep the house running. You know, keep everything going. Uh, became uh, trickier. We were getting. Uh, when we were there in the mid 70s, we were getting into the drug years where the cartels were starting to reach out and take over sections of Mexico. Uh, it wasn't the peak yet. The peak was more in the 80s and 90s, but but it was starting. And uh, we we constructed programs to try to get their cooperation. We would give uh, a lot of physical assistance to get them to get on board with us and uh, uh, passing on to us the uh, suspects in major drug cases so we could try them here. Um, and that's been on and off and has been successful as recently as the last five years. But uh, it's, it's a sensitive matter with any country. Do you give up your you know, when you're accused of violating U.S. law, do you give your accused to the U.S. or do you say, oh, no, we're, we'll try them, you know. So that's that's another issue that's constantly being dealt with. Um, the, uh, the Mexicans have a, uh, a history of keeping their military untangled with the U.S. Uh, we've probably gotten closer cooperation in the last 10 or 15 years after my time, you know, from Mexico than we mm -hmm. than we did before. But uh, the Mexicans are uh, very jealous of their individual sovereignty, their right to decide their own policy. Uh, they don't they don't toe the American line. Uh, sometimes America can convince them to cooperate with us based on some aid we provide or, or some program we enlist them in. But uh, it's it's on and off depending on the on the local government, depending when who's who's in office. Was there any particular Latin American country that occupied more of your time than than others or was it spread out and hot spots happened, and your focus constantly changed. Or yeah, but certainly a hot spot demands the, the attention. So there were times when uh, you know something was going on in Peru or in in the the years of the military dictatorships in the eighties, uh, dealing with the consequences of the Argentine military dictatorship. Uh, took a lot of time. That uh, took a lot of time. It was very, it's very, um, it's very interesting that U.S. military leaders, when they're meeting leaders from a militarily run country like Argentina in the '80s, uh, have to be very careful in what they say. They can can be supportive, but in general terms, not not supporting military rule over. Over civilian rule, yeah. so it's, it's, it's it's diplomatic, and it, and for that reason, we were advising when they wrote speeches, we were ha we had to approve the speeches because they we didn't want them to curry favor with the military, but lose the respect of the of the entire nation. You know, uh, what were, was your time at the Pentagon? Um, set to be a finite time, or was it just your your uh, your assignment to move to um, battalion commander special forces in Fort Bragg? Was that did that um, that offer or that position come along, and that's what motivated you away from the Pentagon? Yeah, that's. 
the toughest uh, selection to make at that point in a military career is to be selected for battalion command. There are many commands available when you're a captain. You can, you'll get a, a, command, a chance to command a company or a chance to command a military unit as a captain. Difficult as a major because there are very few, very few units that have a major in command. I was lucky enough to have one of those in addition to having three as a captain. The, um, uh, the, the need for a, any individual wanting to have a, a full career in the Army, the need is to get into command at every time you can. Uh, so there were a lot of people looking for command of a battalion. It's the only uh, the command position for a lieutenant colonel is a battalion. There aren't that many battalions. Uh, there, obviously more people are promoted to full colonel than are selected to command a battalion. So when you're selected to command a battalion, you're on the top half of the list going forward, you know, for future promotions. And, um, I was very pleased to get my, uh, my offer to command a battalion. There's an annual board that sits with the board of officers judging all the people who are out there who are eligible and plugging them into different jobs. Uh, I was very pleased not only to get uh, a battalion, but I, I got the Special Forces Training Battalion, uh, which was a jump slot. I got to be on jump status and, and uh, it was a very interesting job. I got that uh, just on my record as a Special Forces officer in the past and good command as a company commander, good command as a Detachment A Special Forces commander, good command time as a Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence Detachment commander, all of them. The Army keeps track of your efficiency reports. You, you get a, when you leave a job or, or periodically in the job, you get rated for efficiency. And those reports are heavily studied when you go to a promotion board. That's a that's a form that follows you through your career, right? Isn't it? A form? Yeah. Isn't it a it take the shape of a form in something or? No, there's um there's an electronic version of it, but really, it is individual reports that the commander has to sit down and he has to describe. You know. What makes this officer uh, better effective or worse or than his, yeah. than his uh, uh, fellow officers? What, uh, it, if you rate this officer outstanding, why do you rate him as outstanding? And, and uh, what job do you see him attaining eventually, you know, in his Army career? You know, if somebody puts down, this is the most uh, outstanding officer I've ever seen, he's going to be Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army. No, well, that's really strong when he when he's going in for getting selected for full colonel or, or command. So, so you were you were almost my entire upbringing. You were Major Regan, and you were promoted to lieutenant colonel while at the Pentagon. Well, I, listen, I got a I got a picture of you as a toddler hanging on Captain Regan's uniform on the way to the airport. So, so yeah. you knew me all the way through. You you just. Well, I uh, didn't understand it all. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the, the, every memory I have is of you being a major, major yeah. until you were uh, promoted to lieutenant colonel sometime yeah. in the mid 70s. Yeah. When did you? When were you promoted to lieutenant colonel? I I, I got promoted just uh, maybe six months before I took over the battalion. I was uh, the way they do you like this? the way they do these things. They make a list. And they publish. This is the list. These are the people who are going to be promoted. Approximate date is this, you know. So I knew I was on the list for six months before I got there. And then your day comes up, and and uh, and you you get the actual presentation and the certificate. Um, it's a good feeling, you know. It, it it's a it's a career where really you take the measure of the career. Frequently, you you 
there's a selection for one thing or another, a selection for a school or a selection for uh, a, a board or a selection for uh, assignments. And so you're being you're being judged constantly. You really know, uh, or at least in in my days, you knew where you stood. You uh, no, nobody could tell you exactly your odds of getting promoted, but you knew based on what your efficiency reports were and what jobs you had. You knew whether you were competitive or not. Uh, I was. I was very competitive because even though I started with OCS, which is a which is a disadvantage, the people who start with West Point uh, have a, an advantage. They're an advantage because most of the regular army officers are from West Point. They they know each other from school, and it's not a clique, but it's it's a brotherhood, and it's hard to join it. But they encouraged those of us not from West Point to join in. And for example, I got, even though I'm not a West Point graduate, I got assigned a West Point class, a class that would have been my, my class if I'd gone to West Point. And they introduce you in the class and get to know you. They've, they're pretty good at making uh, people feel accepted and adopted. So what what was so your your most compelling uh, position, your most uh, interesting position, the one that uh, you found the most fun? Mm -hmm. uh, I, in my mind, I'm thinking you would answer that your first two tours in Vietnam were were probably the most satisfying, and probably your third tour in Vietnam the most interesting. I always said the best jobs in the army are for captains. You know, I got to be a company commander in the 82nd, actually before I made captain, but it was a captain slot. I was a, I was a lieutenant and I got to be uh, Special Forces 8 Detachment Commander as a captain. Uh, so I have to say those are the first time the Army really says, here, we're sharing this unit with you. Put your imprint on it, you know, show us what you can do. And uh, I loved it. I, I loved being the commander. Uh, battalion commander is a little less of the direct leadership. It's more like the guy that checks to make sure everything gets done. But like, the, you're, like the head coach you're, of a major. You're one removed from the troops. You know, the, the, the troops go up to a, their company commander and address their problems. And then you handle problems, exceptions. Legal problems, whatever comes along after that. So, were you were you seriously motivated to become a, a battalion commander, or were you uh, checking off the list on your way to full bird? Oh, I I absolutely wanted to be a battalion commander. I wanted the job for the satisfaction of doing the job. It's it was also kind of a re required to get promoted again. If I wanted to be a full colonel, I needed to command a battalion. Right. I would the fact that I was picked. To get a battalion proved that I was already very competitive because there are not enough battalion command slots for all the lieutenant colonels that right. want to get promoted to full colonel. So, so yeah, you were, you were was, in the pecking order for full colonel had you continued and yes, I, I was. Uh, my career was set up. I, I'm unless something horrible had happened, uh, I would have been picked for full colonel. I might have. I probably it would have been competitive for a full colonel's command slot, which is which is even tougher. There are very few full colonel command slots. But I had, having had command up through lieutenant colonel, and had excellent efficiency reports for all my command jobs, I probably would have been competitive for full colonel. And I would have been young because I started young. You know, one disadvantage to some of the people who start like me with OCS or even ROTC, sometimes they're a few years older. When you get to that, you know, age 50 bracket, then it's a question. Do we want to waste a promotion on this guy or do we want to take a younger guy coming up, you know, who will be with us longer? But I was in a good position. I was young, um, could have, uh, I, had a, I had a remote, I always figured 
I had not had anything negative on my military record. So I, I was alive in the battle to become a general. And a, and a few of my OCS classmates became generals. And so it, it could have been done. I always felt like it was a long shot for an OCS guy, but, but uh, we had OCS uh, special forces uh, officer who I knew from, he was in a class, one class ahead of me in OCS. Uh, Vince Shack now, and he was promoted to general, and I think he I think he got two stars too. Uh, you can you can get it from OCS. It's just uh, it's, the odds uh, go down. One star is brigadier general, right? One star is brigadier, two stars major general, major general, three stars lieutenant general, and uh, four stars general. General of the army or general of the general, general of the army is five stars. And we're, we've only had five of those in our history, all during the World War II period. Omar Bradley, the last one, right? Omar Bradley, yeah. Mike Eisenhower, uh, George Marshall. Now you're down to the ones I don't know. <laughs> Two more. Yeah. I'm not sure. So, what um, what do you think the most uh, interesting position was you you held in the military? Most interesting. interesting. What is the most interesting uh, job or yeah assignment that you had in the military? Yeah, uh, boy, that's hard. Is that, uh, assignments are interesting in a lot of different ways. Uh, some are interesting in what you're learning for your military career. The one, for example, the assignment in Mexico, teaching at the Mexican War College, was really delightful to me. I'm a history bug and I love to study history. I had free time. I was able to go visit all the archaeological sites in Mexico and learn about the history of Mexico, which was also part of preparing me as a Latin American specialist, you know, just to know more. But uh, I loved it. But probably I have to go back to what I said before. If you're a military officer, command is is where you feel the satisfaction. When you solve the little problems that make the unit run well, and you get the kid home to see his sick mother when he's trying to get emergency leave and can't get it, you know. When you do, when you solve the on the ground problems, it's satisfying. And uh, so I would, I would take command at any level, and I, and I reiterate that I think the best command jobs are for captains because they, they are right at the front of their troops. They're where the they're rubber talk, meets the road. They're talking to 200 problem cases in front of them every day, and they're handling their military justice, they're handling their supplies, equipment, they're handling their training. I mean, they are really God for military purposes, you know, with that group of people. So I, I would love, not without regard to rank, I would love to have another career being company commander for 20 years. <laughs> but that's not a good career move <laughs> because company commanders only stay for a year and a half or so. They, they, they rotate them around. They don't, even if you were a great company commander and you said, I'd like to stay here, the Army wouldn't want you to stay there. They, they want to rotate people to get them the experience. The Army is like a, a giant training machine. It's always training every individual in the army for that next job and it's rotating people through jobs so that they get a, a really broad base of, of career oriented people moving up that's what i think when i when i look back at your career from from my perspective it was so varied you were you were all over the place <laughs> geographically and figuratively and literally yeah. And, yeah. Otherwise, that I don't think it was necessarily uh, a long shot for you to to, to be a general. I mean, I, I said that's you having resigned as a uh, retired as a uh, yeah. as a lieutenant colonel yeah. is a I, bit of a stretch. I'm just not but, gonna I'm not gonna be so presumptive that I'm gonna say I would have been. I I don't know. There are a lot of sharp guys out there. 
they're all in competition for but you were diminishing. you were in the mix you were I was, in the mix. I was in the mix I was in the mix. Yeah. Uh, I was I was definitely in the mix uh, when I left the army because I had just finished battalion command which is the hardest thing to get at that point in your career and I got like perfect scores as a battalion commander I my general loved me tried to talk me out of retiring and uh, couldn't so I retired but uh, my decision was uh, not just the career in mind. My decision was family dynamics and yeah. uh, a lot of a lot of questions. Uh, so it, it, I think I made the right decision to retire when I did. Uh, I'll always well. Run. You had you had a, you had other interests you wanted to pursue. Yeah. You were you were interested in finance and whatever. I, I will always wonder, you know, would I have gotten a star? I like to think I had a chance. Yeah. What, um, is there a story behind, uh, or am I exhausting the entire story by even bringing up your stolen beret? <laughs> is that the whole story? Or is there more to it? No, that's the whole story. Oh, <laughs> my, my last week on active duty all <laughs> All set to retire. Did my last jump out of a helicopter. Brought the family out to see that too. Uh, Eric doesn't remember it, but uh, I, I think all three of you came out. Anyhow, I was uh, ready to hang it up. I went to lunch in the battalion mess hall, hung my beret. And I remember, I'm the battalion commander, so I hung my beret up on the rack coming in, lots of berets. But only one of them's got the lieutenant colonel. <laughs> so I went and I ate lunch, came back, and I said, do you believe it? My last week in the Army and somebody stole my beret. <laughs> I cursed and jogged and, and uh, my executive officer, uh, Kirky, Kirky said, uh, your Kirky. don't sweat it, don't sweat it, we'll, we'll get one for you. We'll get I said, I said, I don't have a uniform. I can't walk out of here. I don't have a complete uniform. I'm not walking to the barracks without a, without a cover. He said, he said, so he went and he got me a, a beret. And I said, oh, that's very nice of you. Thank you. He said, yeah, and you'll get the other one back in about a week, bronze. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that you knew it was coming back at you. I, yeah, yeah. I thought that when it when it came back to you as a yeah. as a bronze. As a as a bronze, uh, yeah. <laughs> trophy. I thought that was your 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 reveal that you yeah. didn't know it was coming that way. Yeah. Yeah. I, you, I thought there might be more to that story. I remember wants, that. I want you to have that beret. On a, well, um, when I'm out of here. Well, keep it for a while longer, would you? <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. Um, what else? I don't know. Uh, can you, can you um, go over the story from Okinawa, your uh, your AWOL <laughs> rescue? This, this one I hesitate to put on tape because uh, they could come back and and decide to try me retroactively for this one. <laughs> Seriously? Uh, <laughs> but I, uh, when I, on my first tour to Vietnam, gotten down there, gotten set up in Vietnam, had our camp running its training missions, probably there a couple of months, and a typhoon hit Okinawa, a bad typhoon. And uh, I had bought a house in Awasi, uh, up on a hills overlooking the South China Sea. Very beautiful uh, view in the morning. You could look out and see all the way to Guam. <laughs> no, although, not that far. But uh, it, it was gorgeous. But uh, in Okinawa, when they get a lot of rain, and in much of Asia, the ground isn't as stable as it is in other areas, and it, it tends to slip. Well, this, it slipped away from our house on the backside, dropped about uh, 15, 20 feet, exposed our foundation. So I didn't know anything. Uh, I got 
Um, we're talking a sheer cliff out the back door now? Yeah, we're talking a six foot drop out of the back door. Uh, and, and the danger of the hill sliding further, you know, taking maybe some of the house with it. Um, so I'm I, uh, trying to remember how my wife contacted me. I guess there was a, an emergency phone system or something. She got a message to me what was going on, that the, she, the house had been condemned, she had to move out, they weren't offering her any place to live, they didn't have army quarters or anything to put her in, so uh, she was left with a problem. Uh, she was young, she was, at that time, I was 21, she was 19, I guess, yeah, she was 19. It was a big problem to hand to uh, a young girl with two little kids. So I said, I, I went around the problem a couple of times in Vietnam and I said, I, I can't solve this problem from here. I'm going to have to get to Okinawa. So I put myself on three days pass. Uh, three days pass was normal and uh, not I wasn't out of order in taking three days. I, I gave three day passes to my unit members too from time to time. But I took a three day pass, notified my boss that I was gone for three days. Uh, and I, I wound up uh, coming off an operation. We had been out on a patrol. I came off an operation uh, and I had uh, a helicopter that would take me to Saigon, to Tansanut Air Base. And, and I went directly from the operation uh, to Tansanut. I flew, took about an hour and 30 minutes by helicopter to get there. And I had uh, never, I didn't have time to, to take off my armament. I, I still had my rifle, I still had hand grenades attached to my my webbing. I was literally just just off patrol. My face was even painted in black camouflage. So I, I uh, when I got to Tansanut, we landed on the helicopter ramp where there are a lot of helicopters coming and going all the time. They they all land in one area because if you're hitching rides you can kind of check who's going where, you know, you you have to you have to hitch a lot of rides. In Vietnam to find your way to your unit. There's not a scheduled transportation as such. So um, I uh, I landed and I I decided to check out. There's a, another tier uh, higher that has the bigger planes. There were C-130s, a big crop cargo plane, troop troop movement plane that they put into regular service. They had a sort of a schedule. They would fly them. From uh, from Vietnam to Clark Field in the Philippines to Kadena Air Base in Okinawa, they had a, a bit of a scheduled airline there. So I went down to check if any of these were going to Kadena or going to something I could use. You know, and uh, the first very first one was already revving up the engines and everything, but they were going to Clark Field. Clark Field is halfway from me to the Potokanawa. So I said, okay. I asked the crew chief, I said, yeah, I got orders. Uh, can you take them and, uh, and send them into the, to the uh, desk so they know I'm on the plane? He said, yeah, sure, Captain. I'll give you. So I gave him, gave him my orders, went in, sat down in the plane, and I said, oh, what a mess this is. Look at me, I got a rifle, I got ammunition on my belt, I've got... <laughs> hand grenades, three hand grenades hung on my webbing. I said, and I'm painted in, in terrible camouflage black and white grease paint. And uh, I said, this, this, I don't fit well in this group. <laughs> so I, I just went in and stayed quiet. Look. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> excuse me again. The crew chief came through and he checked everything. He said, um, you think you could maybe put the hand grenades on the floor? I said, yeah, okay. I put the hand grenades on the floor, put my rifle under my seat, and we took off. 
and I was kind of surprised that I got that far without resolving the big issue in the room is what do you do with these hand grenades you're flying with and that live ammunition? Well, the crew chief comes to the back of the plane. Uh, that's before you take off. You're right. cleared for takeoff and you're, right, right, right. you're flying. Okay. Yeah, but the, the crew chief kind of let me slide, really, and it was after he got in the air that he called the captain and explained what he had, and the captain decided to come back and take a look. captain was pretty nice. I, he wasn't chewing me out or anything. He said, how do we happen to be dressed this way? <laughs> I said, well, I was on a patrol, have an emergency, have to go back to Okinawa, and as I came in from the patrol, there's a helicopter which is a rare thing in my part of the country, offering to take me to, to Tonsanut, so I jumped right on without changing anything. I didn't even get back to the interior of my camp. Put I us, just went from the, you know, from Put the, us in the frame of mind of the captain. He's, is he thinking, this guy has live grenades, that's the problem, or is he thinking, am I flying someone who's AWOL? No. He's, he's not. He's thinking, I mean, I'm, I'm the real deal, and he's, he's not questioning that. Uh, I obviously have been out on, on an operation, and I've got my ID, I've got, I've even got a set of orders. I've, I, I, I didn't have to show them, but I could have shown them the orders. You look legit just too burdened with hand just grenades. A, 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 legit, a legit guy that couldn't get to the right place to put his gear away before he had to travel. So I said to him, I said, um, well, I, I think I, I know your problem. <laughs> you don't particularly like live hand grenades inside your plane, and I would never have brought them if I had had a second to get rid of them. I said, um, even the live ammunition probably bothers you. He said, yeah, all of that. I said, what do you say we open, take it down to 12,000 feet, open the door, and I get rid of it? I said, I, I've got... Hand grenades are still factory packed. I'm not going to pull the pins on them or anything. They're just going with with the packaging straight into the drink, and uh, then I'll I'll empty out all my magazines. There won't be anything that could fire or explode. I said I and I understand why you need it that way. I, I fully agree with you, and I'm sorry that I had to get on because I didn't have time to to handle this problem first. He said, well, you sound like a reasonable man. <laughs> so we took it down to 12,000 feet. Above 12,000, you have trouble breathing. At 12,000, you're pretty comfortable. So got it down. I opened the door. Set, he put a little safety strap on me, which was nice. I was confident enough not to do, to do it without a safety strap, but he, he hooked me up. So I sat down, and I, I first tossed the three grenades, one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, and uh, they went. They didn't explode, of course, because I didn't the pins. Uh, I told them, I said, they're they're at the bottom of the of the deep blue, and they will not explode. I said, uh, now the ammo. I took my clips out, and I stripped them. Used one round to to strip the rounds out, flick them out into the ocean until they were all gone. Took the last one threw it in, I, I took the weapon, cleared it, looked inside, no, no rounds. I said, I have no ammunition, I have, I have a functioning rifle but with no ammunition. He said, uh, well I'm okay then. He said, uh, don't, don't do this again because somebody else might not be so lenient. I said, I, said, I appreciate that you're giving me a break. I, it was a, a legitimate emergency and I got this fantastic break where two rides lined up immediately. I could have been 24 hours trying to, trying to make the same distance and I got it right right there. He said, okay, well good luck to you, good luck to you. <laughs> so uh, that, that leg going to Clark Field worked out just right. I, I sat back there, we rode in, I got off and we got to Clark Field. And the way you fly when you're when you're flying space available, I have my orders. I have to take those orders in to an operations desk at the terminal, and they they take those orders and they look at the flights they got going out and 
what vacant seats they have, tell you whether or not you can get on. He says, yeah, you, you're on our, uh, we got a, a flight at, uh, it was it's just after dusk, it was like maybe 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock. He said, you're on, you're on our flight for Okinawa, leaving, uh, let's say 7.30. Uh, I said, great, that's that's good. So I went inside, I cleaned up the best I could. I got the camouflage paint off me and, <laughs> and uh, I, I still I still looked very filthy, dirty and and uh, like I'd just come off the, out of the field, which I had. But um, then I went, I had my, I'd already checked in for the flight and I knew we were going to board another hour, hour and a half. So I, I sat outside, waited to board. When they called the flight, I got up and, and walked to the plane from the outside where I was sitting and joined the, the column that was coming out from the building. I got on and I sat back on the, uh, on the back ramp. In uh, a, a C-130, there's a, a ramp that lowers at the back of the plane that you can drive uh, Jeep. small vehicles on or off. And, and you also use it for dropping small vehicles. Uh, so I sat back there because I could see the whole plane. And uh, uh, just uh, as I was set to relax and really get comfortable, I look up and the last couple of people are boarding up at the front of the plane. And I look in there. They're my group commander yeah. who has permitted, who has prohibited people to do what I'm doing, travel back to Okinawa <laughs> on a three-day pass. And, and my sergeant major, who knows everything that goes on in the unit, he happened to be Faye Dunaway's father, by the way, Sergeant, <clears throat> sergeant Major George Dunaway. Huh. And uh, so I said, mm. They will see me at the other end. If that, I, I had my beret on, but I slipped it off, rolled it up in my hand, and then I kind of just stood up like I had to pee. The back door, back ramp was still open. Uh, and I said, I told the crew chief, I'll be back. I stepped down, and I didn't come back. I, <laughs> I, went, I went for the trees, and I laid down in the trees and watched the plane take off. Nobody came looking for me, but my uh, my group commander and my sergeant major didn't want to find me on there. So, so I went back in in the operations center. There was another flight about uh, oh my God. approaching midnight, uh, like a 11:30 at night flight. So I I booked it, gave my orders, and uh, did the same thing. Slipped outside, you know, <laughs> sat in the shadows. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, uh, uh, the flight boarded. I didn't see any other Special Forces guys, so I put my beret back on <laughs> and, and flew and flew into um, uh, Kadena Air Base uh, in the morning. Uh, so Okinawa? Pardon? Is that Okinawa? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was only Kadena Air Base was only about uh, five miles from where I had my house. And uh, uh, I forget. I, I guess I got my wife to drive down and pick me up. I don't. I don't think I took a taxi. <laughs> Again, I still was lugging around a weapon, but I had put it in my pack. Most most of it, it was not obvious. So I got back, uh, ate some breakfast with my wife and two kids that I had at that time, and. Uh, then figured I've got to go see the lawyer. I had already made an appointment to see the lawyer. He said he was going to work on Saturday. This was Saturday morning. So I called to make sure he was there. He was there. It was only like 9 o'clock in the morning, but he was already in there working. So I put on clean civilian clothes, took a shower, and went in to talk to him. He was a, he was a savior. You know, he, he was a young, idealistic captain, and he when I contacted him, he became my lawyer. He now is not the lawyer for the commander. He doesn't represent the commander. He represents me because I contacted him. So he's my lawyer and uh, told him what I'd done. And I was a little 
a little thin on authority, but I had I had orders that said I could go anywhere, but but didn't think they would stand up. <laughs> but anyhow, I told him. I said the real problem is uh, my wife uh, is living in a house I bought three months ago, and when the monsoon came through last week, it it caused the the hill to slide away from the back of the house, expose the the foundation, and the Corps of Engineers uh, condemned my house. They don't have any housing for my wife. They don't suggest any place where she should go, but they tell her with two little babies she's got to move out of my house. So I said, I've got to get some help. I said, I don't know what the solution is, but I figure you can at least help me get a temporary place for them to live, or he said, he said, I'm going to go you one better. What if we can get them to fix your house? I said, I, uh, that's, I don't think that'll happen quick enough to you. He said, I do. I have had a, I've had a similar case and I know how to do it. And so he took over. What he did, called the lawyer for the real estate company that owned the land. I own the house. But you can't buy the land. You have to rent the land. I had a hundred year lease on the land and I and I owned the house. So he called the lawyers for the real estate company that owned the property and he said, uh, are you familiar with, uh, quoted the piece of law, uh, real estate, real estate norm number 7.8 went into what it was, and he said, oh, we've heard of that. And I said, well, actually, it complies you as the owner of the property uh, where you have sold a house on the property, it complies you to keep the land in the same condition that it was rented. Now, I'm told that's going to cost you a lot of money. I said, I won't be, I won't be pleasant about it. I'm told you're going to have to put a you know, a lot of equipment out there, put a brand new retaining wall at the back of the house, go down till you hit bedrock and get the engineers to approve it. He said, here's the deal. I've looked you up, sir. You're doing a lot of business with the U.S. You, you're, uh, you're one of our distinguished Japanese colleagues. We're glad to do business with you. We see, in addition to individual houses, you're, you're leasing acreage. To the U.S. at the out on the outside of Canadian Air Base, and uh, this looks like a, a sizable uh, deal. He said, if you didn't comply and didn't immediately maintain this property, we would be forced to stop doing business with you. We can, we are prohibited from doing business with any company that doesn't follow this set of norms that's in Okinawan law, which we've agreed to. We've had meetings on and uh, it's your obligation. And he said, well, we can't start right now. He said, no, but you can Monday morning. And you better and you better have a truck out there Monday morning, and you better have a lot of good shovelers and a, and a good engineer to decide how deep the wall's got to go. Because we have no place to put his family. They're in the house that you sold him. Yes, he bought it from you. And uh, you are required to maintain the property as it was. I said, you can uh, get on it Monday and we we continue to do business with you. You don't, you drag your feet on this and we're going to cease to do business with you, including the property at the end of Kadena that you're yeah. getting paid millions of dollars for every year. That was a bulldog lawyer. Yeah, he's a good lawyer. Good lawyer. He had done the research, you know. And, uh, and the guy says, he called and talked to some people in Japanese, and then he said, uh, we'll start Monday. So then he said, now you got to go back and talk to the U.S. engineers and tell them that the remediation is being done Monday and that there's no need to leave the property. Just stay out of the section of the house that's exposed. So. Did that? Uh, did, couldn't do it till Monday morning. I didn't know who the guy so, was. So, so all that's left now is to get your ass back to Vietnam. All that's left is to get you back to Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> this was it. This was uh, 
Saturday at noontime, I had solved my big problem. Now, now I had to face that I had to get back to Vietnam. I, I did a little research with my friends and uh, found out that uh, the colonels, the colonel was watching departures from both Naha Navy Base and Kadena Air Force Base, which were the two C-130 fields. So I went around and around on it, and, and uh, they, they were they were very strict about that. They were not. It's, they had just decided to really clamp down on it. Is what had happened. So I was in the first group that was getting pursued. Uh, so I went. I, I tried a number of things in my mind. I couldn't get anything that really worked. So I finally bought a civilian ticket. I bought a civilian ticket that took me from Okinawa to Taiwan, Taiwan to Hong Kong, Hong Kong to Saigon. Uh, and I wore civilian clothes and I, I had my rifle folded up in a suitcase, doubled up. I didn't look like a military guy uh, unless you went into my suitcase. <laughs> And so I, I, I got on the plane, no problem, no inspection going on that caught, caught it, and uh, I flew down to, uh, to Taipei. This is where I was a little worried because at Taipei I actually uh, uh, had to go through international customs. But because I was on that flight both in and out, I was able to stay on the flight not take my bags through customs. I had already <laughs> theoretically come through. So I sat there and it took about two hours in the airport. I'm sitting in the plane. I said, don't you want to go inside? And I said, nah, I, I, I like to sit here and relax. <laughs> and uh, a couple hours later, the flight took off. We went to Hong Kong, which uh, I was really afraid of going through Hong Kong. But it turns out because my flight was ticketed, uh, direct from Taipei to Saigon. Uh, I was already on my de destination flight and I didn't have to go through customs there either. <laughs> but I thought I was going to be dead on that one. And I didn't get any any trouble until I arrived in Vietnam. And I, I only got trouble there because I, I'm in civilian clothes, I got a rep weapon in my suitcase, which they found and going into Saigon and uh, I don't have anything showing that I'm military until you question me and then I pull out my documentation. But uh, the Vietnamese MPs came and they first it looked like they wanted to make a big stink about it and sent uh, arrest me and make the embassy come get me and, and little by little I talked them into slowing down a little bit you know I, I said look here's Here's my uh, military orders. I had to leave on an emergency. I have to be back tonight, which is why I'm traveling at this time of day. You're talking to the MPs, and you tell them what? I I, I told the MPs I'm, you know I'm I'm an American. I have travel orders. Uh, I had to go on this trip, but I'm I've got to get back tonight because I'm on an operation with the Vietnamese Special Forces, Look Long Doc Biet, and I gave. Them we were re technically on a joint operation, which lasted like three months, but uh, I was able to cite the operation, the, the Vietnamese colonel who was in charge of the operation, and uh, so little by little I kind of broke them down. They were going to call USMPs to take me, and I said, there's my plane right out there, I'm getting on that plane and I'm flying out of here. You don't need MPs, you're sending me back to combat. <laughs> I uh, I slipped out of there uh, and flew back up country. I had to fly with uh, <laughs> Air America. The, yeah, was, you see, you These were the Chinese like guys, you know. And Go ahead, sorry. They were uh, they were flying C forty sixes, and they were they kind of recognized me because I've been on a couple of their flights already. And they said, uh, "Where are you going?" I said, "Well, I I'm hoping to go to." Uh, Bambi to it. Or if you're going north of there, 
I would even like it better if you could drop me off at Boon Ving. I want to I want to uh, make a parachute jump and land at Boon Ving. He said, "Well, we could pass over Boon Ving. That's right on our way." He said, "But we don't we don't have any uh, army parachutes. We just have Air Force reserve chutes." I said, "Well, I." Don't like jumping those, <laughs> but I can do it. I said I can take an Air Force Reserve shoot. What the, the real reason I didn't like it is they those things sit around in a plane for a year, two years. They don't get checked. The people sit on them, spit on them. <laughs> but anyhow, it opened. It opened. I had to do a, uh, a piece of parachute cord. I jumped holding my suitcase in front. I had a Samsonite suitcase. <laughs> I remember it well. And I, I held it in front of me, but I had a piece of parachute cord tied to the, the handle and up to my main lift webbing. So if, if I had lost a grip or something, it would have just hung down below me. But I didn't lose the grip. It stayed there. It flew up when I jumped out. <laughs> stayed in control. And uh, when I landed, I was the team really wanted to know everything, and I didn't tell them everything. <laughs> they said, I said, "Where the hell did you go that you're coming back jumping?" <laughs> I said, "That's top secret. you if you were authorized to know, you'd know already." <laughs> and that's that's that story. Uh, and I was back. I, I think I figured out I was supposed to be back by. 10.30 at night, and I think it was, when I went in and made the entry of my logbook, I think it was 10.45. <laughs> might, have been, might have been late by 15 minutes. Huh. And that's probably, I can only give you an approximate, it was the dead of winter, it was so cold. So this probably took place, uh, wouldn't be my first winter there because you wouldn't, you don't get sent to those kind of schools right off. You. You get that as a plum as you go along. You have to, in order to jump from small army aircraft and to be a jump master for jumps from small army aircraft, you have to have a week of special training. So I applied for it and I, I went to do it. It was really a cold week in Fort Bragg. It must have, must have been like uh, 20 degrees and just nasty. It was not typical North Carolina weather. Anyhow, uh, the, the jump that we were doing, uh, this was one of a series of jumps, but this one was from uh, uh, de Havilland. Um, so it's a three place uh, or a, a three wheeled plane, uh, carries about six passengers in the back and a pilot and a co pilot. It's a medium sized plane. And in order to jump from it, you remove the seats. You take the seats out. You sit on the floor in the back, and you squirt out one at a time. It's a, it's a little bit difficult, and there's a known problem with the plane. The plane has three fixed wheels, and the tail wheel tends to it tends to fly with the the tail wheel down a lot. It's it takes it takes an upward attitude in the air, so you got a problem. When you when you jump out the door, the parachute can hang up on the tail wheel and and does from time to time. So the 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 uh, only solution they've got uh, had at this time, they've since come up with something much better. But now the only solution when I went through the school, you carried a switchblade knife on a cord, and if you got out and you're main parachute hung up on that tail wheel, you had to get out the switchblade knife, cut yourself loose from the main lift web so the parachute on both sides. It's a pretty good, it's pretty thick material. It's a saw to get through it. It's not, any, not an easy cut. And, uh, and then you open your reserve. After you're free from the plane and free from, uh, then you have to manually reach down and pull open your reserve. Well, this was a, like I said it was a really cold day. I had um, I had some good heavy gloves on, you know, and uh, 
my hands were still freezing. Uh, I got set. I put the uh, as a, I was the jump master of the of the flight. I was the one who was actually appointed jump master of this group. A group of five or six of us that were jumping. Uh, the jump master uh, goes last. He sits back from the doorway so he can see each of the other jumpers as they go out the door on their on their seat. They're sliding out on their seat, and uh, and then when they're all out, he scoots over and, and follows. So I, I, it this didn't look too tough uh, as far as the the problem with the wheel. It's it sounded like a it could happen problem, you know. No, it did happen. <laughs> it did happen. I uh, I got out. And the funny thing is, I didn't recognize correctly what was happening. I got out and um, waiting for my uh, parachute to open, and I didn't feel that tug. I looked up. All I could see was my parachute. Uh, trailed out like a streamer, like a uh, parachute that hadn't opened at all. I didn't, at that point, I didn't assess the noise or didn't see the airplane. So at this point, I said, okay, you're going to have to uh, get loose from this parachute. You're going to have to cut yourself out. So I went. For the knife, and I shouldn't have done that first, but I, but I went for the knife first. The knife, me, the instructor, me, me, the jump master, had put the knife, tied it to the main lift web, but then I had put the other main main lift web across the top of it when I did my parachute. The the cord should have been on the outside of everything. It was on the inside. I could not get the knife. I could not get the knife, and I'm. Now I'm hearing uh, a motor straining, and I said, well, wait a minute, what do I got here? I, I'm, I hear the motor. Why do I hear the motor? And I looked up, and then I could see I'm hooked on the tailwheel. That's what happened. I didn't, uh, you know, I, I didn't have a streamer. So I can't, I can't cut the main lift web. Uh, the, the engine on the small plane is really straining. I mean, <coughs> he's flying uh, a six-passenger plane with Big Me hanging off the back of it and changing his angle of attack. The, on, on the way that I'm applying sure. is causing him to stall out, take the plane higher than he wants to. He's trying to, he's trying to turn it over and he can't. Uh, so I said, well, i got to get the knife. I tried it again. I couldn't get the knife. I said I've got to. I've got to. Uh, uh, maybe I need to get rid of my gloves so I can pull my reserve. And I said oh, no, no, don't do that yet. Don't do that. And, and then I said, uh, I think I'm screwed. I don't. I don't see a real solution here. So what I did, I I, I just reached up and the motor. I hear this plane really straining now. This plane is. It's about to lose it. It's slowing down and nosing over. You know, it's losing losing flight. So uh, I just reached up and grabbed my parachute and and shook it. You know, grabbed, trying to break it loose. And the first time nothing happened. I listened again, and that plane's now the plane is actually speeding up because he's tipping down towards the ground. I did, I did the same thing a second time as hard as I could, yanked on both main lift webs and a, and a hole tore in my parachute. Mercifully, a hole tore. And the uh, parachute opened. It, was, it had a hole about six feet across. Now they, they don't, they can't teach you how to judge your speed. When you have a partial malfunction, sometimes you've got enough to write it in, sometimes you don't. Now I had that decision to make: do I, do I, let this parachute go and try the reserve, or do I write it in on this one? How do so, you, how do you uh, break away from your main chute at this point? What's the, uh, 
Is there a, uh, a mechanism to do that? You don't no. have to cut away. That's, that's the, the, the knife. The knife is the cut away. Now they have a thing called cape wells, which you just squeeze and get rid of it. But back then they had nothing but a knife. And, uh, and I said, well, I don't think I'm going to get to that knife in time to cut it away. I said, let's write it in. <laughs> you know, so I, lo I looked around. I'm, I'm coming down pretty good, but it didn't look like dangerous speed. It looked like I should be able to make a landing, you know. And I, I went up into a, a real tight tuck and got, got ready and rolled like hell. You know, I just wanted to dis disperse the, the energy on, on a roll. And I didn't, I got up and I was okay. I pulled the parachute off. I had a, I had a big piece missing. I actually kept that piece of parachute for a long time. It was in my in my jump log, folded up, and I don't know, it got away, got it, got lost. But uh, so I I got down on the ground, and I was uh, I had had a lot of adrenaline in my system, and I was kind of shaky, and uh, so I got down on the ground. There's another guy sitting on the ground there, and I sat down next to him. I said, "Damn, you look as nervous as I do." He said I was the pilot. <laughs> he said he said we were seconds from death. He said you had stalled out my plane completely. You had absolutely stopped my forward motion. The plane was falling out of the air when you shook yourself loose or cut yourself loose, whatever Good. you did. Yeah. And and my plane responded just before I hit the ground. It dropped it dropped uh, two hundred feet and then I was able to flare it out and land it. He said, I have a right to be more scared than you. You didn't know what you were in for. I did. <laughs> Man, I, I had not heard that before. Really? Yeah. That's my, uh, that's a, that's that's my an oldest incredible. jump story. Yeah, yeah, that's an incredible story. Yeah. This is from, from where exactly? Fort Bragg. Fort Bragg? About a year after I went to Fort Bragg. It was winter. It was the depths of winter. So I'm guessing it was winter 61. 